pay you. What do you want? I want to see the sun. I want an escape. You there? An office with a beach view. I want a natural town. You? I want to taste real food. Something well aged. And you? I want to relax. I want peace. All you want is Greece. Hello everyone, welcome back to PLZ Disrupt Summit 2021. My name is Liliam Silla, I'm a marketing expert, and for the second year in a row, I'm going to be your host for these two days. So here we are, thanks to Product Led Growth Hub, the world's first PLG Academy. And of course, many thanks to our sponsors, the National Bank of Greece, Focus, Corey related and sales machine. We're also very proud to have the support of the Greek National Tourism Organization, the Ministry of Digital Governance, and of course, Rebrain Greece. We are so honored this year to be hosting more than 50 thought leaders from leading tech organizations like Salesforce, Accenture, Miro, IBM, Vodafone, Slack, and Google. What you're going to see is more than 40 sessions and workshops, and of course, many Q&A sessions on digital transformation, customer experience, product-led growth, career development, startups, and of course, all things tech. But this year's PLG Disrupt Summit comes with a twist. Why, you will ask me? Because Product-Led Growth Hub introduces for the first time its career development features. What does that mean? You have just to visit our career lounge to connect and engage with tech recruiters from leading tech organizations live online. So don't forget to also head over to our jobs board and browse the multiple career opportunities offered by our partner. We expect more than 2,000 attendees from all around the world and may do more because we will be streaming live on multiple platforms via our social media and communities and of course via our media sponsors like CNN Greece, Startupper, Jenny, Epihiro and Neolea. So many thanks for spreading the word and supporting throughout this event and for those that they see us from there, hello from the other side. Let's cut to the chase now. Today we're going to cover topics such as digital transformation with six experts on the panel. We're also going to have a very interesting showcase of Salesforce, IBM, and Zendesk to walk us through the latest developments in customer experience in tech. We're going to talk about PLG with multiple sessions and Q&A among them, while Despinex Alaktilu, the founder of Product Led Growth Hub, is going to present a crash course about, what else? How to become product led. If you're as excited as much as we are, we will wait for your questions and feedback about what your most valuable takeaways that you're going to apply to the day to day workflow. So get ready and we hope we'll, we'll enjoy. See you later today. Bye bye. Hey, you, what do you want? I want to see the sun. I want an escape. You there? An office with a beach view. I want a natural town. You? 
I want to taste real food. Something well aged. And you? I want to relax. I want peace. All you want is Greece. Good evening to all of you and welcome. Congratulations to the organizers for the PLG Disrupt Summit presented by Product-Led Growth Hub. I would like to start with a question. So, is technology going to disrupt the tourism sector also? In a positive, ethical way, we say yes. Without any doubt, the pandemic acted as a catalyst for dramatic changes in the labor market in general, and especially in the tourism industry. Beyond the reality of teleworking, which permitted even very small businesses or industries where distance employment sounded like a science fiction scenario, a new class of workers, professionals, emerged from this crisis who gave another meaning to long distance work. Could we all be, in that case, digital nomads? In fact, digital nomads are not as new as we might think. The term digital nomad was introduced by Makimoto and Manners in 1997 to describe an outcome of technological advancement on people's lives. They predicted how mobile and portable technologies would augment work and laser and produce a new lifestyle in which people are freed from constraints of time and location. Thus, the term digital nomad describes a category of mobile professionals who perform their work remotely from anywhere in the world, utilizing digital technologies, while digital nomadism refers to the last lifestyle that is developed by this highly mobile location independent professionals. Our country is now entering the race for digital nomads in a market that is considered highly competitive, especially in the tourism sector. Greece, as you have already know, in the midst of the unprecedented health crisis, managed to become known to the international community as a location of high safety, while maintaining its position as a top of mind attractive destination. But it's not only about recovering anymore, it's about improving and transforming our sector to be more sustainable and seamless. This is an important target for us in the GNTO and we are developing a more tech-friendly approach in promoting Greece. Of course, the pandemic made this way of life much more prominent. However, there were always workers who decided to move for a shorter or longer period of time. In Greece, these are countless examples. When a lot of countries around the world are dreaming up new ways to attract digital nomads, why choose Greece? Is a nice beach enough? Greece is naturally blessed with a temperate climate lots of sunshine and a combination of beaches and mountains for all year round. Of course, like any country, Greece has its fair share of bureaucracy. But where you crave a change of scenery after being stuck at home in lockdown or simply because you'd rather look before you leap, a perfectly valid choice, you may find that just two months of going digital in Greece is already a lot better than a mere two-week holiday. After all, who says you need a tax break to call yourself an nomad? Once you board that plane, you are already in the realm of the new, different, maybe a little risky, but also the potentially wonderful and productive. 
all of that underscores the what travel is supposed to be less about frequent flyer points, more about discovery. So in this sense, the administrative aspects are just one part of the picture. Once you've digested that, Greece's new digital nomad tax cut does emerge as a clear incentive for road warriors to pull up closer to the Parthenon, or maybe a nice ribbon of beach on an island safe like a butterfly. Power up the laptop and stay a while. With these thoughts, I encourage you to visit Greece, the country which is among the top destinations. The country with the breathtaking landscape, with the unique ancient and contemporary culture, the famous Greek gastronomy, excellent weather conditions, easiness of communicating in English, hospitality, the famous hospitality, internet access and speed, reasonable apartment rental costs, and a vast variety of places to visit, and so on. A unique combination of tradition, history, and modern world with an easy transportation and the cost of living lower than that in most of the countries of the Western world. To conclude, I would like to congratulate you for this so important summit under the auspices of GNTO. Thank you. Hey you, what do you want? I want to see the sun. I want an escape. You there? An office with a beach view. I want a natural town. You? I want to taste real food. Something well aged. And you? I want to relax. I want peace. All you want is Greece.
Hello, can everyone hear me? Χαίρετε. Καλησπέρα. Yes, we can hear you. And I was muted. Hello. Uh, welcome all. I am uh, Kostas Kitschitzis, business and tech journalist at Capital.gr. And I uh, will uh, moderate this discussion about uh, digital transformation. Um, I don't know if we are all here. Uh, uh, for sure, we're waiting from OPAP, National Bank of Greece. And yes. I think another one from Deep Sea, if I remember well. Yeah, deep sea. Yeah, I thought I okay. showed two people. That's why. Uh, anyway, one person. Okay, we will uh, start our discussion. Uh, this is a way. Ah, okay. Hello, I see everyone. everyone is here now. Hi. Um, so once again, um, I'm Kostas Kostas Kitsidis. I'm um, a business journalist at Capital Dojiar. Um, and I will uh, moderate this discussion that we will have today about um, digital transformation. Uh, and we would like to see what it is and how it affects our lives and our way of doing business. Um, without further ado, I would like to, to welcome you all and uh, uh, present uh, everyone in this discussion. Um, we have uh, with us together um, uh, Miss uh, um, Marisa Melio, Group uh, Audit Director of PAP. Um, Hello. Miss, Mr. George Pano, Head of uh, Innovation Center of uh, Eurobank and Board me Member of uh, EVI. Mr. Kosadinos, Mr. Kosadinos Kirakopoulos, Co-Founder and uh, CTO of uh, Deep Sea Technologies. Hi, good to be here. Mr. Uh, Vimitris Memos, CEO of Marine Traffic. And uh, Mr. Nikos Bokfos, Head of uh, Open Banking Platform of uh, National Bank of Greece. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Uh, our goal uh, today is to have a range of discussion and, and not any individual presentation or uh, talks. So I will present a series of, of topics. And uh, after that, each of, each of you will have about two or three minutes to, to, to um, present your opinion. Um, and we will start with a topic of our uh, panel, which is, of course, digital transformation, which uh, in, in its own way, it has become a kind of buzzword um, uh, those last years. And I would like to, 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 um, to hear from the European Union about uh, what it is, how can we define a digital transformation, and how can we measure it? And um, I'll say that we can start with... Um, uh, Ms. Melio? Uh, in simple words, uh, to me, it seems that it's a continuous shift uh, of our uh, business, society, and economics to uh, the online business platforms, to online sales channels, to digital economy, to digital communications and apps, to digital communities, to digital workforce, digital culture, e voting, and digital decisions. Uh, how do we measure it? I think by the improved customer experience, how our customers feel, if they feel positive, if uh, the solutions that we provide to them are human-centric, if the users uh, are active and have a, 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 what is their engagement level, the extent of digital solutions and products adoption, the increase in uh, process efficiency, in workforce productivity, in transparency, inclusiveness, if we have reduced risks, if you have increased the return on investment, in specifically in the area of uh, tokenized economy, I think that it's the adoption rate. And recently, this has reached 3% of the total money supply uh, in the world. Okay, thank you very much. And um, let's go to Mr. Panu next. Okay. Thank you. First of all, we have to understand uh, what, why we need digital transformation. Uh, it, I consider it of three steps. First, of, first is uh, digi digitize. So you have to make all analog uh, procedures and data into digital. After that, you have to make it digitalize. 
digitalize them. So you have to uh, find tools in order to use them. And uh, finally, you have the digital transformation, which uh, it is uh, the effect that uh, all these things have to do with the society. Uh, in more details, um, what uh, digital transformation is, to my opinion, is the effort of uh, the companies in the 21st century uh, to position themselves competitively uh, in a world that is constantly changing uh, using cutting edge technologies, either transforming their existing uh, business models or creating new ones. And also, uh, I would agree with Marisa, uh, she co covered mostly uh, what, uh, how we can measure uh, digital transformation. Uh, the main uh, uh, purpose uh, is to, to have uh, happy customers. So customer satisfaction is one of the utmost uh, uh, measurement that you can have. Of course, you have others like uh, operational efficiency. Uh, you have uh, reducing costs, automation, uh, uh, re reduce the workforce uh, uh, load uh, so that they can, uh, humans can have other activities, more productive ones. So. That would be for me. Thank you. Um, I would go to Mr. Kriakopoulos. Uh, yeah, so every organization needs to continuously ask itself, is the way I'm doing things now the best way possible given the technologies that are available? So the digital transformation essentially is having that awareness, doing the analysis of what it is that needs to change in order to ensure uh, medium to long-term business survival and then profitability, and then implementing the transformations. Uh, I, I would say in terms of measuring digital transformation, it's very important to remain tied to the particulars of the, the organization that you're trying to transform, because at the end of the day, the metrics for business uh, for digital transformation are uh, the profitability and survival of the business in question. So they are whatever the metrics of performance are of, of that particular uh, sector. So, uh, for example, my customers are in shipping. Uh, we try to translate everything we do in terms of offering them digital transformation solutions to the metrics they already have and explain to them how what they're already doing has to change and will become better uh, um, if they adopt the new tools, both now but also in the future. So there's an element of what transformation can you do now to increase profitability immediately, and then there's an element of uh, what do you need to change now so that you'll be a, in a position uh, to be ready to take advantage of tools that will become available uh, in the future. Uh, so yeah, my message is that it's a very uh, customizable and very varied term. Uh, I'd also like to say a little bit about kind of our area of specialty, which is artificial intelligence, um, which is of course only one of the many different things you can do in, uh, in digital transformation. Uh, the artificial intelligence essentially, in simple terms, allows you to uh, teach an, a computer how to re uh, replicate something that has been done many times in the past of essentially arbitrary complexity. So there are two questions that everyone needs to ask. The first is, is there something in my organization that a human is doing uh, that could be done instead uh, by an algorithm? And uh, secondly, uh, is there something repeatable going on, which I can't predict now, but which if I could predict, uh, would um, increase, uh, would make my life easier or, or increase my profitability, but which I could be measuring. So for example, uh, for a lot of, of, of companies, the market they operate in, their customer's behavior is not predictable, but could be made predictable by collecting data and then trading algorithms. Uh, in my case, what, what we specialize in is the ship itself, uh, making the ship itself predictable by collecting analytics from it. And, and being able to power data-driven decision making by giving uh, stakeholders the ability to predict how a ship will react. We will have the opportunity to discuss more about this um, yeah. at, uh, at later um, questions. Um, and um, uh, Mr. Memos, what's your Hi. take on uh, this um, information? Hello. I think that uh, the group has covered it pretty pretty well. Um, I, the only thing I, I could add is that. Uh, talking about non-digital uh, companies, uh, digital transformation is a necessity for them to remain relevant in our changing world. So, uh, you know, we have to differentiate between the uh, various uh, uh, stakeholders and uh, we can, uh, you know, visit this uh, topic uh, 
in, in that context. Because we could be talking about distant transformation of the country as well. Namely, namely Greece at this time. So, yeah, that's the only thing I could add. The rest, um, you're have. covered. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Bogdos. Okay, uh, firstly, I agree that uh, digital transformation indeed has indeed become a buzzword. Uh, and as such, usually it is easy to, to be deprived of actual meaning in day-to-day -day, uh, communications. Uh, but at the same time, digital transformation uh, is an inevitable journey uh, for, any, for any organization that wants not just to stay relevant, but uh, to lead in this era where the speed of digital progress redefines our tools, it redefines our processes, our communications, how we work, and how we interface with customers. Now, monitoring this journey's progress uh, can be achieved with metrics about the usage of the tools, the, uh, the engagement and participation level of the, of the users, and of course, the productivity of the people. However, the focus on specific APIs usually differs uh, depending on the organization and its progress on this journey. Thank you. One, one of the reasons that uh, we have um, uh, digital transformation and uh, digitization um, in our uh, everyday um, uh, vocabulary is uh, the pandemic. Um, and I would like uh, a little bit to discuss um, more specifically how, how did COVID-19 um, affected, is affecting the business landscape and speaking of, you know, of um, customer experience of uh, of uh, better services um what are um, some of the permanent changes that uh, that you can uh, see um in the way that we do business um due to the pandemic um i would like to 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 start this this round of discussion from uh, uh mr pano thank you so uh it's uh a reality, unfortunate reality, that in the last uh, two years it has been difficult for everyone and for all the businesses, uh, especially the businesses that uh, were not uh, digitally ready, because uh, those ones that uh, were cloud ready and uh, internet ready and they offered service for the cloud, uh, it was um, a very good opportunity. So uh, this is what we saw. But uh, for other companies like uh, car rentals, uh, restaurants, uh, cinemas, uh, gyms, it was a, a disaster. And uh, I think we have uh, still many things uh, to see as we are moving on a dynamic environment. Um, uh, the future, uh, some things of, uh, that will change in the future is, uh, of course, the future of work. Uh, we're going to have remote. I saw that in your advertisement uh, in the beginning about the digital nomads and uh, i don't think uh, the jobs will ever return to normal probably and uh, i i wish i uh, i'm mistaken but i think we're going to see a huge change but uh, this is not necessarily bad because we'll see transformation also new business models for the jobs and also we will see new jobs uh, created and uh, maybe this would be better for everyone Let's see. Mr. Um, Kyriakopoulos, uh, uh, do you agree? We see, we see a, a permanent change in the, in the um, um, work for, workforce uh, landscape. And uh, what are the other changes that we can um, define after the pandemic? Yeah, so in terms of the labor uh, landscape changes, I've you know li lived this very practically and uh, very personally. Uh, I'm a, our company hires a lot of uh, very young people, as you can imagine, because of its nature. So we can see trends that you know in the future will be more widespread. Essentially, we've stopped talking about national labor markets, and we're starting to talk about global labor markets. And this is a huge shift, especially for businesses. Um, you know, that have adapted their business models to what the labor costs are in a particular place. Uh, you know, one, one thing that my company does a lot is it finds people um, that, are, that have studied abroad or working abroad and tries to um, kind of incentivize them to, to return to Greece and work for us. This is something we had successfully before the pandemic. Now we actually have more people that want to do this, but what they say is, yes, I want to come to Greece, but I want to come to Sparta. I want to come to the Demodios. I want to come, uh, you know, I, I don't want to come to Athens. Uh, and at the same time, they want to go to the Demodios, but they still have a job offer to work in Switzerland, uh, you know, to work in. So this remote essentially means that we now have to all adapt ourselves uh, to the 
uh, what will eventually become a single, you know, global cost for, say, Java developers or whatever it is. Uh, now, there's also a flip side to this, which is this is also happening in other markets. So if I want to sell a product in Norway, the advantage that a competitor that was in Norway a kilometer away from the office of the customer had over me doesn't exist anymore. They talk on Zoom to the customer. I also talk on Zoom to the customer. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think... Uh, I will uh, just uh, repeat uh, what has already been said that uh, uh, it's it's a change. It's not necessarily good or bad, but it does mean that we all need to be aware of it and we need to adapt ourselves. Mr. Memos, what's your uh, your take and your experience from uh, your company? Well, my experience from my company is that uh, we're fortunate enough to uh, belong in the group that uh, George mentioned at the beginning, being digital ready. Uh, beforehand. So, you know, we, we changed the way we work, but that happened overnight and we saw it as an opportunity. So moving to remote working uh, from one day to the next didn't change anything in our uh, actual productivity, which was a great thing. And that leads to a number of opportunities, including what uh, Costas mentioned regarding access to global talent and everything else, um, which we see that we see that a lot. I mean, it's uh, a reality already. And it does work both ways. Um, and these changes are here to, to stay, obviously. Um, if we look at the, at the topic a bit more, uh, in a bit more abstract way, I think, you know, the other thing that uh, is here to stay, in my opinion, is the planning. Planning has gone out of the window. There's no long-term plans anyway. We've come to expect that change is the only uh, constant and everything else. So, you know, Concepts like agility and fragility and everything else are uh, actually becoming relevant and uh, a necessity uh, with all the change that's going on. Um, and that's here to stay as well, in my opinion. Uh, and uh, maybe one more thing would be, again, going back to people and, uh, um, uh, you know, this great resignation that we're seeing here. It's a reality that, you know, these couple of years have given people the opportunity to rethink or prioritize. And this is again a new challenge for the companies to rethink and reprioritize, you know, from the other end so that we find a way to give meaning to the to the team, to people and uh, purpose, which is now becoming a much higher priority. So I think, you know, this is also something here that's that will stay and it's an important change. Yeah. So, Mr. Bogos, we have um, a changing uh, labor market, a changing market at all. We have um, a constant changing market. Change, I think, it's a, a common uh, uh, thing. Um, what, what, what else is very um, speaking of? You know, providing services um, to the customers. Um, what has changed, and what will stay in this way after we we've done with the pandemic? Okay, uh, all these changes that you mentioned uh, were already uh, existing, I think, uh, even pre-COVID. Okay, so to my eyes, uh, I think that COVID-19 has accelerated transformations that were already taking place uh, pre-COVID. Uh, for example, the office and the workplace habits that now are completely overhauled. Uh, the tech was already there. Uh, hybrid work was destined to become the norm sooner or later other because employees like it or because of climate change or net zero demands or just because it just makes sense okay um another example of the interface with our customers uh, sure covid speeded up digital adoption by a couple of years or more uh, but here again this was already a pre-existing place uh, a pre-existing pre -existing, uh, process uh so yeah to my eyes covid can be seen as an evolutionary filter that selects habits and processes um processes that are relevant of course and that makes sense uh, for the years to come. And um, uh, Miss Medu, um, what what um, what's your your opinion? In especially, well, in in the ways that we we may transact or maybe we use um, all the digital tools that are now uh, at our disposal. Uh... I agree with the, with the rest of the panel that hybrid hybrid work uh, was actually a mass scale experiment that uh, proved that efficiency often comes with greater flexibility. So 
short term, I think that hybrid work, hybrid work models and digital customer experience experiences seize the opportunity by adopting progressive a progressive mindset and a discrete set of steps to smooth execution. And let me give you an example. At top up, uh, the online and digital teams have increased the digital games offerings to our customers, but they have also uh, developed a unique pop up store app for the for the digital player's journey to enjoy self-service and real-time location-based player services, we are engaging with the, one of the biggest in, uh, IoT ecosystem in the Europe, in Europe, using 10,000 beacons and three, in 3,600 stores. So this was is, is one example. Now, if I take this, um, if I take this uh, question for the decentralized finance for the blockchain economy that that is here and stay with us. I would say that more and more banks, we will see more and more banks uh, and corporations adopting the blockchain technology. Uh, actually, uh, I recently uh, saw that uh, Credit Suisse and, and uh, Societe Generale, uh, they, they are using already for settlement blockchain technology. We will see in the very near future central bank digital currencies coming up. Um, we will also see uh, fewer intermediate in parties in our financial transactions. We will see more transparency, more privacy in our transactions, less co uh, more cost savings, less cost in our transactions. Uh, and just to give you an, a, a magnitude, an order of, of, of what cost savings we could have, uh, JP Morgan recently uh, estimated the cross-border transaction savings between four central banks and 19 retail banks that took, pl took, took uh, place in this experiment of, uh, of more than $100 billion. Um, apart from this, uh, I'm, I'm going back to the workforce. I think that we will also see the need for change in the educational programs. We will see the need to upscale our workforce with digital skills. Because in Greece, we, actually, we rank at the bottom of all EU countries in, in terms of digital, digital skills. And I think that we will also, because, because human health crisis um, and environmental sustainability became joined uh, with issues of personal safety due to, to pandemic, we will also see that uh, consumers will be more, will be mindful. So companies will not only have to to adapt to the demanding regulations about sustainability, but they will also have to take true to address truly their customers' perceived new health and safety requirements. Thank uh, you. Can, uh, I, can I jump in just to add? Yeah, of course, of course. Touching upon what Marisa said about uh, uh, OPAP and the, the gamers experience, I think that you know because of the acceleration of uh, usage of digital tools. Uh, during the past couple of years, we'll see a lot more user-friendly software and experiences uh, throughout even B2B software that used to be very boring in the past. So you know, that will be a, a change as well. Um, getting, taking game, uh, game tactics, for example, from online games and using them into uh, B2B software. Something that will uh, obviously be uh, very welcome by users that are at the same time consumers and gamers. So yeah, that's, that's something yeah. Okay, thank you very much. And now that we have um, described in a way the, the, the new landscape, let's say, um, I would like you know to 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 discuss, discuss um, some things and um, more relevant to to your um, fields of um, business and to your industries. So in uh, this wave of uh, digitization which is taking place um, um, what are the main trends that you that, that you see um, on your um, on your fields and um, I think that we can start from a from a banking sector we'll start to, um, with mr. Bogdos. okay um, at bank um, we observe our customers shifting from brick and mortar to, to digital channels. And in general, this shift remains steady regardless of the virus seasonality or government COVID restrictions or stuff like that. 
Um, additionally, we partner with corporate customers by onboarding them uh, on our API platform, where um, our partners can integrate their systems directly with banking services and consume many other digital services beyond banking. So we closely observe our partners uh, taking uh, their ride on this uh, digitization wave. And like I, say, I, can, I can say that uh, we take great pleasure watching them as we go side by side from ideation to production. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Pano, like, Mr. Pano how, how do you, do you access uh, innovation uh, at Euromonk? Okay, uh, first of all, um, if I could summarize about uh, the trends that uh, uh, make a, a bank uh, to be relevant in the next uh, um, future uh, age, let's say, uh, I could say that um, uh, I would say the rise of open banking and open finance, uh, like uh, the PSD2 uh, that came uh, in the last years, uh, the broad usage uh, of automation, artificial intelligence, machine learning for hyper personalization, uh, and of course, RPA and uh, chatbots. And uh, also, that will aim to a better customer experience and uh, aiming for operational efficiency. So, again, um, COVID as a catalyst, but it would, it would come either way. Uh, Customers will go to digital and uh, omni-channel experiences, and this would be a standard. Um, it will base it will be based uh, on technologies. Uh, so moving to the cloud will be um, uh, something that you cannot avoid an imperative. And of course, the people uh, upskilling and reskilling uh, that that would be the the next changes uh, in the banking. Also, in order to to facilitate with all these changes and make this happen, you need to take uh, in consideration what Peter Drucker was once said. He said that um, you cannot uh, manage what you cannot measure. So you need uh, to have a very good infrastructure in order to have data in place, use analytics, and with that to take decisions. So you see that all these technologies come together and now it's the time because uh, technology is at its best and it continues to go that way. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Maidu, um, we spoke about the digital experience, which is something that, you know, it's a little bit um, vague in the, in the um, uh, uh, minds of uh, some people. Um, what, what, what's, uh, what does um, um, the new digital and new digital means for um, OPAP and your industry? I don't want to talk about uh, OPAP more. No, about, okay. uh, I think that the, the example that I gave is quite, I think is, is representative, but uh, I can tell you about my team, which my team is mm -hmm. an internal audit team, is not considered uh, the uh, forefront of the line, of, of the, it's the third line of defense is, is at the back, let's say, of uh, of the field, uh, but uh, my team is already is using using uh, robotics and artificial intelligence. So if my team is using these tools, I understand that everybody, especially in the in the front line, will be using these tools. Um, but if I if I if you want me to focus in the blockchain economy, in the blockchain uh, technology and area, I would say that. Um, uh, we see right now we see the establishment of the internet of value of, of, of actually um, the blockchain technology and its uh, use cases. We see that the adoption in Greece has increased, and we already have two hundred thousand users engaging engaging into crypto asset space. Uh, we see that we uh, the, the, the rise of decentralized finance. Uh, in the last two years, uh, this space has increased 23 times. Um, there is an autom we, we see the, that loans origination will come automatically with no fee, with, without the need for, for credit rating. We see decentralized security settlement, decentralized art making. We experience uh, the, the extensive money exchange for digital collectibles of games, of sports, with non-fugible tokens right now. 
which actually has become a friends, a recent frenzy. And uh, also we'll see the emergence of, uh, we see the emergence of Web3 and the semantic web. Um, multi, multi-chain integration efforts in the blockchain, on-chain and off-chain use cases, DAOs, decentralized autonomous organization that uh, will not need the human interaction to operate, but just software code will rule uh, and rules will be applied in smart contracts. Um, the, this space will increase a hundred times as the as the experts say. So of co- just to, just to close, this mm-hmm. this all this uh, has has all this momentum momentum in alternative finance has uh, not been unnoticed, and and governments and regulators do worry about the, all the transactions that take uh, place in there. And we had a, no, a hot autumn recently, and uh, many regulations have been drafted, and we will see the actions next year in this area. Thank you very much. Uh, and now let's go to to an industry. Uh, I'm talking about shipping, which is it's not very very famous for its uh, digital digital readiness. Uh, and uh, we can start with uh, Mr. Um, uh, Memos. Well, I can uh, I can say we're trying to make it famous. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it will take time. Um, but uh, again, things are changing uh, as everywhere and uh, in a faster pace. So we can you know, zoom in, zoom out and see it at different levels. Um, from a user perspective, I think the same, uh, same thing holds as Marisa said. I mean, people are more receptive to new technologies and they are much more uh, uh, receptive to hearing from new tools and the solutions that can make their lives easier. So that's one thing that's changing across the board. Um, in shipping specifically, again, as uh, as in banking, I guess, uh, data analytics and stuff like that are actually becoming to, uh, to be real in, uh, in shipping. Uh, data-driven decision-making and uh, is something that, that uh, people are listening to uh, now. Um, I'm sure Costas will, uh, will tell us more uh, stories about that as shipping is evolving. Um, and if we, if we zoom out, I mean, uh, you know, the supply chain is uh, under a great duress right now, as we all know. So uh, that, you know, uh, solutions that give visibility to the supply chain right now are very uh, trendy and people are, uh, uh, you know, shipping is mainstream these days. And that started from COVID, I guess, but uh, digitization that's happening at the same time uh, helps uh, provide actual visibility in the space. So. You know, there are these things that are uh, pushing innovation and um, making things happen. There's And there's another trend that's coming uh, on top of that. Um, and that's all about, you know, decarbonization, for example, in the, in the, in the industry. And uh, again, digitization plays a, a great role there. As uh, you said before, nothing can be, you know, that's not measured, can be managed. So that's something that uh, is happening in tandem in the, and we're, we're expecting to see a lot of uh, change there and impact into the, to the environment. And all this will obviously lead to something like autonomous shipping, everything connected and all that. Mm-hmm. That's in the longer term. In the long run, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Mr. Kirikopoulos. Uh, yeah, so as um, Dmitry said and you said, the uh, the shipping industry is, is not famous for its digital readiness. And, not, I think, because uh, there's something you know wrong with the culture of shipping, but primarily because the nature of that business is that there are a lot of very specific technical requirements and um, and just day-to-day requirements that uh, um, kind of the broadly available digital solutions aren't able to cover, and and so that means that there's a natural hesitation to uh, to adopt new technologies, and any new technology has to go through a lot of uh, of adaptation before it can be applicable. To shipping. I mean, uh, marine traffic uh, was an early pioneer in this who, uh, you know, gave hope to a lot of us that it is possible to bring quite a lot of change in the industry. Uh, I would say that the big thing that is kind of newer and that is really driving innovation in shipping, which uh, Dmitry has mentioned, is uh, the decarbonization. 
Uh, there's a lot of very, very mounting, uh, uh, yeah, increasingly mounting pressure on shipping to reduce the CO2 footprint. And the technology to do this through alternative fuels or through some other method is uh, not uh, there yet and won't be there for quite a long time. And so increases in efficiency are going to be necessary if the industry can remain profitable as regulations come in and as pressure from, from banks and from end customers and from all sorts of places uh, increases for, um, for, for better fuel efficiency. And what uh, we look at uh, at uh, Deep Sea is, is we think of the decarbonization problem as part of a broader uh, lack of predictability problem. So you, the, the ship burns more fuel uh, than, it, than it could be burning uh, because it can't predict how much fuel it's going to burn and therefore um, it can't make decisions optimally. So we help them in this area um, and we have you know, developed a, a deep learning based solution which uh, is able, given uh, historical data, to predict for a particular ship at a, at a particular time uh, what its fuel consumption will be in any conditions and thus be able to automatically optimize what route the ship should take what speed it should go at, when it should be cleaned, et cetera, et cetera, uh, in order to, to optimize it. And uh, what is necessary from the, from the side of the, the shipping companies, with the help of, of us and any other companies that, that do this, is to get the necessary digitalization in place so that this sort of optimization is possible, right? So to build in the discipline, to record things digitally, to measure things with sensors, to, uh, and, and, and to have them brought into the, into the cloud so they can, they can be processed. But the way I see it, this is... Um, a one-way street. There, there's no other option than to do these things for the industry. And so sooner or later, they will do it. I think this we should see this as an opportunity for Greece, as a company that is the uh, the strongest in shipping internationally, uh, to be a, a pioneer, not just in the sea but also on the shore in terms of building the the ecosystem that can uh, that will will host the data and will provide the, the digital transformation. Oh yeah, thank you very much. As we have only. Um, well, five minutes, four and a half um, left for um, our discussion. And um, I'm sure that we could go um, uh, for many hours. Uh, but um, I would like um, each of you to have, you know, uh, something like a closing statement. And um, maybe if you want, you can, um, we can address some of the challenges because we spoke about the opportunities. Maybe we can uh, say something about the challenges in uh, um, on the way, but, but, but established co uh, corporations or startups, uh, what are the challenges that uh, they will meet in their um, road in the trip to 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 the new digital future? Uh, we will start with um, the order that we we will finish with the order that we started. So, Miss Medio, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, one in, yeah, in the area of blockchain technology, I think that startups, companies that they start now, uh, they will have uh, uh, the challenges are in terms of skill shortages, in terms of uh, uh, limited understanding from the regulators, uh, in terms of uh, potential uh, of, of the new laws that may come up and may create, uh, may, may have a harmful, harmful impact in the innovation of uh, uh, innovations that the products and services that uh, will come in, in market and of course ethical considerations now about the capital the, the capital that they should raise uh, just to say a few to two words uh, i think that there are lots of tools right now in the market uh, initial coin offerings security token offerings crowdfunding processes angel investors innovation hackathons and so on uh, the momentum for funding for innovative products and solutions is the best, I think, in the market uh, because uh, uh, we have never had uh, in the last decade so many EU funds for innovative projects. We have 750 billion euros, so let's make good use of it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Pano. Okay, I will be quick uh, due to the lack of time. So. The challenges, I would say that uh, there is uh, the challenge of the fierce competition uh, between the giants and uh, the startups in order to prevail. Uh, it is uh, the hiring um, suitable ca candidates, so you need, uh, there is a lack of talent, as everybody says. Uh, also, financial management. Uh, uh, companies and startups do not fail because they're not good, they fail because they lack of uh, cash flow. 
and uh, last of it is uh, the the struggle to to find uh, customers. Uh, customers customer is king. So uh, a startup or a, a company and enterprise uh, needs to focus on the customers. Uh, finally, one one more word about uh, the funding. Uh, I think also, like Marisa said, that we are a very good situation because we have the Equifund that it is shared among the, especially for Greece I'm talking, uh, is shared among, uh, they shared uh, about 300 million uh, euros uh, yes. among the, the VCs. So it's a very good opportunity. So in order to get funded, you have to have a very good product. Mr. Kiriakopoulos. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll mention two main challenges. Uh, as has already been said, finding and keeping good people in the new global um, labor market. And uh, two, demonstrating to, uh, to customers what the return on investment is of a digital transformation solution in tangible terms. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Memos. I agree about the talent acquisition being the, the challenge across the board, and I would add especially for corporates, the, the challenge is the mindset shift that needs to happen for talent acquisition to become a case as well. Thank you. Mr. Bogovas. Okay, and from my side, I think that the main challenges uh, involve the workplace and being able to retain culture and enable coherent distributed teams. Uh, the, the digital literacy of our customers, many of whom are forced to migrate from physical to digital and might be more susceptible to scam. And from a tech perspective, we need to combine the sometimes countervailing forces that include uh, uh, the, the urgent need to solve uh, imminent problems, while at the same time uh, evolve in a solid manner uh, the digital platform that will allow us to continue to innovate in the future. Thank you very much. I would like to, to thank you all for uh, your time and your um, ideas. Um, I believe that we had an uh, interesting uh, discussion and um, for um, uh, all, all the people uh, that uh, um, are uh, here in the PLG Summit, uh, stay tuned for the discussions that follow. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, you very much. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay, I assume that I am live now and that everyone can hear me. Um, just want to verify that. Um, you can see me and you can see my presentation as well, I hope. Yeah, Hello. Sorry. Hey, hey, hey. We are full of them today. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to PLG Disrupt. We are excited to have you with us again this year. <clears throat> Hi, Jonathan. We have hey, with us good. the only, one and only Jonathan Maimon, <laughs> Product Marketing Director at Elementor and a returning speaker to PLG Disrupt, of course. Very, very happy. <laughs> Jonathan will talk to us today in a one-hour session about how to turn web elements uh, into uh, to turn product features into web elements that convert. I said that correctly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, he will. It will be one of the kind session, of course. I, uh, Jonathan has shared with us many insights in the past, so we don't doubt that. Uh, do you want us to brief a bit the audience what they should expect? And we can take it from there. All right. Um, we actually, there's a dedicated part of the presentation for that. But um, what I think, uh, I hope that all of you will, uh, uh, will leave this hour with uh, is two things. First of all, why web pages are 
great and why 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 it's it's a it's a it's a it's a marketing asset that needs to be preserved and needs to be developed and um why in my own personal opinion it is the amalgamation of all product marketing is skills and capabilities that they all kind of is shine through in in that particular asset and uh, i will also kind of uh, walk you through a, a case study of uh, how we approached um, our own website, elementor.com, uh, and kind of remaking it, rewriting it, uh, and, and, and reintroducing uh, the company basically and the product to the world. Um, so I hope, uh, hope you'll stick around. Yes, I'm sure they will. Uh, the interesting thing is that, you know, we call it a website, but in essence, it is a product. So we will try to see your website as a product today. Jonathan will mm -hmm. help that a lot. We're looking forward to learn from you and you don't need me here anymore. So without I think I did take it from here. I'm gonna leave it and talk soon. Thank you, Despina. Um all right. So um as Despina mentioned, my name is Jonathan Mayman. Uh, I'm the director of product marketing at Elementor. Uh, and we are going to spend the next hour um, talking about uh, how at least I view my, you know, uh, um, personally, the importance uh, of web assets and uh, web elements in the product marketing uh, work and in the product marketing discipline. Um, before we continue, um, I've learned uh, over the years that um, you really get people to listen uh, by sharing a few personal details about yourself. Then you know you kind of you become a little bit more rounded as a human and, and less uh, a, you know a, a face inside a inside a square. Uh, so as I said, my name is Jonathan Mayman. Uh, I'm the director uh, of product marketing at Elementor. I am, I am very, very fortunate to lead a team of extremely talented uh, PMMs and researchers, uh, some of which you can see in the picture, uh, uh, smiling on the very iconic pink staircase of Elementor. Uh, I live uh, in Tel Aviv, Israel, which is where I'm talking to you uh, now today. It's a very rainy day, kind of the first we've had in a while. Um, I'm married to Lilach, uh, a fellow PMM as well. So uh, that's uh, there, there's a lot of uh, uh, shop talking uh, in the house. Uh, we exchange a lot of ideas. Uh, I am a father of Geffen, a nine-month-old uh, human being, um, and uh, Lucy, a two-and-a-half-year-old bunny. Um, both which uh, are very dear to me. And I am a, you, you can call it a retired musician because you can't really ever retire from music. You can only not practice it on a regular basis. Uh, I did, I was a professional musician for the better part of my twenties. Um, it's still uh, exists in, in, in who I am and, and what I do and how I approach things. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the professional aspects of it had to, uh, uh, had to make make room uh, for other things. Um, okay, so now that uh, we kind of got to know each other a, a little better, um, let's dive in. So on the top left, you see what is officially recognized as the first public web page. So when the internet was officially introduced um, for the public uh, in 1991, uh, the World Wide Web. This was the first web page that was uh, that was live uh, on the air. As you can see, it has very little uh, beyond plain text and some hyperlinks. Um, this was still groundbreaking at the time. You know, if you can uh, close your eyes and imagine how you have, how technology uh, looked to you uh, in the early nineties. Uh, and then on the bottom right, you have a a, a pull out from what. I kind of consider to be one of the one of the best um, product homepages around, uh, which is Figma's homepage. Um, Figma, generally speaking, is a product I uh, I, I adore greatly. I use it uh, on a daily basis, and it has been uh, very very transformative, uh, specifically to the web design industry. Um, and so, kind of, you know, in 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 thirty years, we've gone from the ability to display text uh, 
as part of a publicly accessible web address that people can navigate to, to creating uh, fully fledged experiences, to create apps uh, that live inside websites, to create uh, software as a service, uh, which are uh, fully formed um, and, and kind of you know, deep and profound uh, um, software solutions that uh, hitherto existed on, you know, as, a, as, as an installation file for something you would install on your desktop. Everything now lives in your browser, uh, which uh, gives the web page specifically as a vehicle for uh, communicating product benefits that much more important. Um, and we will go uh, in a little bit through um, the various ways in which uh, in which web pages serve the product that is at their core or the product that they eventually link to uh, in a way that is uh, absolutely irreplaceable. Um, we let's actually go down to here and kind of what uh, we are going to be discussing. Uh, so as I said, web pages uh, for me, and this is something that will kind of be uh, be woven into uh, my entire uh, my entire presentation. Um, why I feel and uh, as a product marketer and as product marketing uh, leader uh, at the company I work for, um, and as a product leader in a company that uh, uh, creates a web building uh, platform why I feel that web pages specifically are in fact the pinnacle and the, the cross section of all product marketing skills, um, how they can be used in which ways uh, web pages um, are ideal for communicating product benefits. Uh, how do we measure them? What do we want to look at? Um, that is a, a very significant part of, of what we're going to talk about. What uh, I believe is kind of the winning recipe for a successful feature page and um, with the time that we will have uh, left, uh, I will walk you through uh, the process of uh, how we transformed Elementor.com uh, from uh, what it was uh, and what it served uh, the company in its early stages and how we approached this uh, as we matured and as the product deepened. Okay, so. Um, so a few areas in which I feel um, web pages and web elements are absolutely ideal in um, being vehicles for users to explore products and to use products or to access product uh, funnels um, more than I guess any other form of marketing and any other uh, any other asset that uh, might be delivered to them. Um, for one. Um, as web pages, um, you know, still kind of uh, not deviating too far from the text and link as part of a, a permanent and publicly accessible um, address. Uh, ultimately, what web pages uh, are meant to achieve is to deliver messaging through storytelling. Uh, at the core of product marketing, and one of the things that uh, um, you know you can argue a lot about what product marketers do and what their job description is. But one thing that is very rarely argued is that they uh, establish and develop and distribute the product narrative. Uh, and that uh, is being manifested and played out through product messaging, which means what do I want users to think about and to understand about the product and how it impacts their lives and the various ways in which they can use them and the various problems that this product solves. Uh, and so web pages are extremely effective in delivering messaging through storytelling because ultimately it is a rhetoric docu a rhetorical document um, that can um, inhabit um, oh sorry yeah, yeah closer to the mic here sorry um, hear me better now if that doesn't work I can switch mics also uh, okay. I uh, hope you can hear me better now. I am a little bit, uh, a little bit closer to the mic. Okay. So as I said, um, ultimately, uh, web pages are a a combination of text, 
uh, at ver with you know with various hierarchies and typographies, visuals, uh, links, embedded content, um, and it is extremely effective in that regard to the actual form of messaging delivery because you can um, you have very um, distinct control over what is more prominent than other, what is more visible, what is bigger, what is first, what is second, what is basic and what is advanced, uh, what is the main call to action and what is a, oh, actually like it's, you know, it would be nice if you also checked out. Uh, so messaging is all about what is, it, what's the first thing in order of importance? What's the second thing, third thing? What is relevant for 90% of the users? What is relevant for 1% of the users? Web, uh, a web page allows us to uh, uh, create that and deliver that hierarchy uh, extremely well and extremely effective. Uh, another thing that a web page allows you because it's, uh, because we've come so far and because uh, technology has enabled uh, for so many things to exist within uh, within a website. Uh, if you are, for example, a company like uh, I'm sorry, so we uh, we saw here a screenshot of the the, the hero section, uh, the first fold of a um, uh, of a website from a company called Gong, uh, which uh, are kind of a, a industry industry leading in in, in uh, sales enablement and in uh, uh, optimizing sales cycles uh this is from a the website of a product called zeppelin uh, the product designers uh, in the audience uh, surely uh, would you know are, are familiar with zeppelin uh and it, it's to this day i think one of my favorite uh, one of my favorite websites and i've tried to kind of figure out how I'm uh, almost kind of stealing uh, this little uh, uh, this little nugget uh, for one of my own uh, pages. Uh, since Zeppelin is a program and is a, is a service that allows for front-end developers and product designers to communicate together under one um, um, sort of under one uh, 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 workspace. Uh, and because product design has a lot to do with um, with the size of elements and the color of elements and pixel perfectness. Uh, and so if you go on Zeppelin, uh, Zeppelin's main website and you hover over the main CTA, uh, this little grid pops up and you can see uh, what the radius of the button is and what the, what the hex code for it is. Um, so kind of, you know, you, you immediately get a sense of like, okay, I understand what this product is about. Uh, and for a company like Zeppelin, this is a huge uh, branding opportunity to show that you know they don't they they are actually actively incorporating their um, their, their their philosophy and and their their product benefit into little supposedly insignificant elements of their website. Um, so in this way, they were able to flex their own branding and design capabilities. Again, a, comp uh, a product meant for product designers and um, and uh, front-end developers. So this is, you know, this 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 sort of a wink uh, towards the professionals is 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 very usually very highly appreciated. Um, it is it can be the starting point of the customer journey, as we said. Um, SaaS products are the norm. Okay, no one hardly ever creates desktop apps. Uh, everything is cloud-based, and everything. Uh, is browser-based. Um, however, you need an entry point. You need a starting point for users to enter a funnel. Uh, even if this funnel is entirely uh, exists entirely on the web, you need a, an a, an address, a URL for what we call anonymous traffic. So those who aren't signed up or aren't subscribed to a service. Uh, and so web pages are by nature the entry point and the starting uh, the, the the place where a customer journey starts. It's the place where um, you want to uh, highlight your main value proposition, the reasons why uh, customers should believe that your product uh, will, uh, will solve the pain point that they are suffering from. Um, you want to be positioned better than your competitors. You want to 
uh, even maybe compare yourself or to um, uh, make yourself an uh, an analogous with a, a competitor or a competitive or similar products. Or in case of lemonade, you want to you want your customers to forget everything they knew about insurance. Uh, lemonade is a one of the main disruptors in the uh, in the insurance uh, field. Uh, happens to be an Israeli startup as well, uh, and they're going, they're they're uh, doing very very well in the home insurance market in the U.S. Uh, if you click check our prices, that will essentially have brought you into the funnel. You have created an account uh, all through a, a very, very minimalistic, but heavily branded uh, first uh, fold hero section of a website. Um, another thing, um, web pages, specifically uh, those who serve uh, product companies and, and their features, um, do very well is by breaking down complex product benefits. We have, um, you know, since again, we are in the era of SaaS platforms, SaaS platforms usually are extremely, extremely deep and, and extremely varied in the features that they offer and their capabilities and the buyer's persona that they have identified for themselves. And what web pages can do very, very effectively is to break down those complex product benefits so that. I, as a layperson, for example, Airtable has basic uh, um, applications and extremely advanced applications. I want to be onboarded onto those. I want to start with what I know and what I can expect from day one and to have in my imagination somewhere down the line how I'm graduating to more and more complex features as my use cases expand. Uh, and so Airtable, for example, does it very, very well with having a very clear and albeit a little simplified messaging on the left, connect everything, achieve anything, and then they expand a little bit on that in their H2, the subtitle, uh, the subheader of the, of the hero section. But then on the other side, they show me uh, visuals that al allude to the complexity of the, of the platform. So, you know, I'm seeing charts. I'm seeing invites, I'm seeing chat, uh, I'm seeing status notifications. Um, so I can sort of start envisioning and imagining how that experience would be for me as, a, as an end user. Um, of course, another thing, and we will get to that obviously later in the session, is um, web pages allow for measurement opportunities. Web pages come built in with a variety of, um, of kind of it, let's let's uh, let's make up a, a term: eventable uh, uh, assets and uh, and pieces of content stuff that you can assign events to, uh, and it immediately uh, places a benchmark uh, for different types of traffic and different types and different cohorts of users, uh, and you can sort of place all these uh, measurement opportunities all throughout the page. And you can start measuring which button, which call to action, which visual, which uh, offering performed better. Uh, for example, here you have Monday.com's homepage and you see that there's a checklist above the main CTA of what would you like to manage with Monday.com work OS. So even before you were a logged in user, Monday.com uh, has basically provided themselves with an opportunity to learn more about their anonymous traffic by offering a very uh, um, you know low friction low commitment sort of engagement uh, checkbox interface <clears throat> uh, something that everyone that comes to monday.com will probably uh, find themselves and can identify with and um, sorry to take a sip of water which also serves as a way for them uh, uh, to really place uh, their 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 target audience, they're basically saying th these are our buyers persona. This is what you can do. This is what you can expect to achieve and to optimize and to work without limits around project management, marketing, software development, and so on. Uh, so um, they've they've essentially uh, provided themselves with a data enrichment layer about uh, traffic coming to their homepage, which is a really smart move. Uh, and of course, delivering messaging through experiences. I think one of the things we didn't really touch upon uh, up until now is that uh, with the standard of 
user experience being what it is today and with um, standards of user experience that uh, previously applied to the products themselves <coughs> uh, are making their way to uh, you know up, upper and upper uh, the, uh, up the funnel so these experiences uh, and this is kind of also maybe summarizing um, most of what we've uh, what we've looked at so far uh, it's the ability to deliver messaging deliver a story to deliver content and product benefit through a web experience through something that uh, that visitors would actually enjoy consuming and enjoy scrolling through um, um, scrolly telling is a buzzword that is kind of being circulating around uh, look into that this is something we've been trying to uh, also apply uh, to most of our designs uh, recently so something that uh, people will not just uh, consume content uh, rhetorically and passively but will actually be engaged and interested and fascinated um, because uh, we are able to deliver such experiences today um, so when we're talking about uh, web content, we've seen we've seen most of them. We're talking about um, we're talking sort of ad hoc uh, pages such as marketing landing pages and lead generation. So most of those things you would see if you would look something up on Google and would click on an uh, a, you know one of the the SEM ads, one of the sponsored search results. Usually you would land on an ad hoc page uh, that serves that particular ad for measuring purposes, uh, which uh, the, uh, the main purpose of such a page is to get you moving forward as fast as you can, uh, while providing you with enough information and enough reasons to believe that on the other side, there is a legitimate offer and something that answers your initial query. Um, product launches, uh, as we've seen, um, web pages are extremely effective in breaking down complex product benefits. So if you're launching a new product and that product does something that is relevant for 90% of the users, and then a little bit more that is relevant for 50, and that is relevant for 20, and that is relevant for 10, and relevant for one, um, a, a, a website is extremely effective uh, form of delivery for that messaging. Uh, there are many, many ways uh, to support a product launch. People do videos, people do emails. They do social posts, they do blog posts. I believe uh, wholeheartedly that uh, you haven't really cracked your, uh, your, your new product or your new feature if you haven't laid it out uh, in web form because a blog lets you write infinitely as many words as you can. There's no limits in blogs. Videos. There are too many limitations in video. It has to be of this length. And video production is relatively uh, uh, expensive and, and laborious. And um, there's something about a website that just kind of encapsulates all. And also, it can be the starting point to every other material uh, that you have produced. Uh, this is a practice that we at Elementor uh, try to adhere to with every new feature we release. Um, we we try and, and make sure we accompany that uh, with a dedicated page, um, partly because we want to uh, provide an experience together with, with the product benefits, and also because we are a website building company and we like to show that we eat our own dog food and that we use our own product uh, when, whenever we can. Uh, evergreen pages on a website, uh, so that is everything that exists in the header menu or the footer menu or the home page itself. Um, stuff that are there, usually uh, evergreen pages tend to uh, kind of spring up uh, in a very concerted effort and remain there sometimes for even several years. Uh, usually it's a kind of cross-company effort uh, to determine what the content and the main messages of these pages would be. And we would, uh, I'm, I'm not going too deep into that because I want to save something for, uh, for the end when we talk about our own, uh, our own journey to, uh, uh, to redo and revamp uh, elementary.com. Uh, pricing pages and purchasing flow. Uh, most products nowadays have, uh, you know, have some sort of 
area in which users need to choose which how they wish to pay for the for the feature, which plan they wish to choose. Uh, there are uh, different sets of rules uh, and best practices for how you construct pages like that. I've been up to my neck in those in the last several months, uh, and it, but it is absolutely fascinating uh, to approach uh, the psychology behind um, purchase, making a purchasing decision when you have very similar products uh, juxtaposed against each other. How do you create differentiation? How do you justify for a price? How do you make two different products uh, uh, comparable or incomparable? Uh, and it very much harkens uh, uh, Seth Godin's legendary positioning uh, book, uh, which actually talks about placing products on supermarket shelves. Uh, so it kind of feels a little bit like that. Uh, and SEO pages, I've listed them separately because um, obviously a great deal about, um, about web content is the ability to discover it and to stumble upon it in the right context. Uh, and so um, sometimes in order to achieve that, you would create pages that are built for the sole purpose of being discovered around a specific topic. And they don't necessarily are about uh, delivering an experience or delivering a specific messaging, but just to be something that comes up in search results. And that will be the starting point for any further, uh, any journey further into, into the website and the product. Oops, sorry. Uh, and as I started, uh, basically, I think one of the main principles and what really uh, appealed to me about creating this um, and, and kind of uh, delivering this talk uh, is I'm extremely passionate about what I do. I uh, stumbled upon product marketing uh, almost by accident. Uh, little, little known or not little known fact at all. Uh, I've been doing product marketing for the uh, better part of the last six years, all of which have been around, um, let's say, technology enablement products. Uh, so things that help ordinary people achieve professional results, particularly around uh, building websites and building web presences. Uh, I've, uh, prior to Elementor, which I've, uh, I've been uh, working in for the past 18 months, uh, I was working at uh, Wix, so essentially the other <laughs> across the street uh, for uh, about four years. And so kind of I've been around both product marketing and website uh, building platforms and how to use websites with product marketing disciplines to promote website building platforms. Not try and say that uh, really quickly, uh, five times in a row. Uh, and I became very passionate about both the aspect of, uh, of creating uh, and, and delivering effective uh, website experiences, as well as product marketing. Uh, and for me, product marketing is in, in many ways, as I said, to be the main and the most effective storyteller in every organization that we are a part of. Uh, and storytelling comes in various shapes and forms, and there are very, uh, um, there's a variety of storytelling disciplines within uh, the, the, the tech realm. Um, and I'm, I, for one, I'm extremely, um, you know, extremely happy and excited that the, this is getting uh, more and more spotlight uh, in recent years, uh, especially I want to say in the last two years, uh, when companies realize that they do need to, to, to sell themselves better, better in the form of stories, uh, if they want to acquire new uh, new audiences and new customers that were rushing online and suddenly using tools that were a few sizes too big for them uh, so that they can restart their business online after their store or their bar or their restaurant shut down. Uh, so for me, um, websites, web elements contain um, the main uh, storytelling uh, disciplines that product marketing employ uh, every, uh, every kind of every day, uh, UX, copywriting, and so, you know, so at what you're experiencing as you're, as you're scrolling through the page, what you're reading, the choice of words, 
um, the design, design, design and visual content. So both, um, you know, the 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 colors and the general layout uh, of of a page and the actual images and and imagery and visual language that is being uh, is being displayed. Um, Funnels, which is one of the uh, one of the key things that product marketers are obsessed with. So, what made someone make it from point A to point B in one piece without dropping? So, this always starts with the highest point in the funnel, which is in most cases a page. Um, and brand, as we've sh as we've shown, it's there's there. I've yet to to encounter a more effective and um, and impactful way of communicating your who you are and your brand values uh, in a memorable way, uh, more than more than a landing page or more than a, a web page. Um, as I've mentioned um, in the beginning, um, what uh, I and sort of kind of the, you know the, I, I can I look at uh, web uh, assets and web elements. Uh, from two different perspectives. One is, yes, I enjoy creating beautiful things with talented individuals, and I enjoy the marriage of uh, many storytelling disciplines, but I also really, really like how uh, web pages just allow for us to measure what is very rarely measurable. Um, because you can plug every piece of the uh, of the website to analytic an, uh, analytics tool or analytic service uh, because you're able to see where most of the visitor attention went to uh, how far down did they scroll where did they click most what happened ultimately with each click creating various funnels from various uh, call to actions um, test different uh, visuals, testing different messaging. So a lot of the times it is very, very difficult for us to, uh, let's say, measure our branding efforts or even measure product marketing efforts. That is, uh, a lot of the times it's, it's very um, notoriously difficult to measure. <clears throat> um, and uh, uh, putting a web page uh, in front of the product just invites for... Uh, it you know, is, is an invitation for a lot of new measuring opportunities and a lot of new f f funnel behaviors and cohort analysis um, that that can later have enormous impacts on growth, on adoption, uh, on how you upsell your product, uh, how you optimize your marketing efforts, uh, how you uh, account for attribution of various channels. And everything on the page is an event. Everything, every element, every piece of text and button and, and image and section can be assigned to an event. It's something that is significant um, for you to measure. Uh, and that's the beautiful thing about, uh, about web pages, in, in my opinion, is that they just, apart from being very uh, experiential and very, uh, you know, kind of, pleasing to, to, to look at and to scroll up and down uh, and, and, and a means to tell a story. Um, they do, I guess, what every, you know, every marketer always dreams of, uh, which is to combine story with numbers and to, and to show how messaging A performs better uh, in a monthly cohort than messaging B. And how mess and how call to action three uh, got the least clicks, but the clicks that came from call to action three resulted in uh, purchases of higher plans, for example. So all of that is something that you would want to measure and you would want to keep a clear image of because that uh, is always the starting point for the next iteration and the next optimization you would want to do. Uh, with your uh, with your pages, um, some things to look out for. Um, I I've so I've been talking a lot in in praise of experiences and in praise of brand, 
and how there's really like no limit to what a web page can be in, uh, in the pursuit of communicating product benefits, communicating a main action that needs to be taken and sort of what the next step is and why this is the right thing uh, uh, to do. In order for all of this to be effective, uh, we do need to be minded of a lot of um, potential pitfalls uh, and areas that we would want to uh, to, to kind of make sure uh, we, we, we place our attention on. Um, so for example, uh, I always put a great deal of attention on the hero section of every web page I'm involved in. Ultimately, as far as I'm concerned, the hero section needs to be something that captures as close to 100% of uh, the, uh, the intentions that brought people to this page to begin with. Uh, if I can't deliver an effective and, and coherent message uh, in, the initial, uh, in the initial section, um, then I guess I, I kind of, uh, you know, I, I, I failed. And Okay. Okay. So, um, so hero section coherency. So basically, what will get everyone to scroll down, uh, preferably, or even just to click on the main button uh, and make it through to the next step. It all depends on your hero section coherency. I've Pasted, I put this uh, screenshot uh, from the main, it, it kind of deviates from, I guess, what the main topic we're talking about, but this is, it's a, it, it's, it's a classical example of something I hate so much, I love it. Uh, this is the website of a, a London-based restaurant um, and their website is immaculately made. It is like, you would not think this, web, this is a restaurant's website and it, it, it's, when I first encountered it about two years ago, it was also, also very, very unclear how do you even use it for the purpose it was designed, which was to book a reservation. Now they've made it a little bit clearer, but if you go on that website, it's a restaurant called Sketch. Um, they're a really good restaurant. I have nothing wrong to say about that, uh, but their website is, is kind of favored um, the experience and the the you know, kind of what you would say about the website rather than what the website needs to do. Um, so we want here, we're looking at hero section coherency. We're looking at page performance, um, a very, very important aspect that uh, is becoming more and more relevant, uh, specifically with um, uh, something called uh, uh, core web vitals uh, that Google uh, announced um, uh, several months ago, and it's a new standard for ranking pages, which uh, account for um, various uh, performance-related metrics on a page, specifically on mobile. So if you want to look at page performance and mobile experience, uh, those are things that will heavily impact uh, how a page is ranked uh, and how uh, ranked, I mean, what is what, what, what will be the, the page's SEO score. Um, and, um, and and by you know by, by association, it's um, it's efficiency, um, flashy UI. So like this is more or less why I pasted this example here. Uh, you want like you want to flex your branding, but you also want people to understand where they are and where they need to go. Uh, and you might have. Um, uh, you might want to kind of you know show off that you can that you have really really uh, advanced uh, advanced design capabilities and development capabilities, um, but you kind of want uh, the experience to be clear and to not get lost in uh, the bells and the whistles uh, of the experience. You were really really struggling to uh, to uh, to create because. You thought that would serve a purpose, uh, which kind of also uh, ties to uh, the next bullet, compounded experiences. You want the navigation from one page to another to feel like it's all part of the same platform. 
uh, context and tone switching, uh, this has more to do with what um, what the page, how the page reads. Uh, so you want, you don't want to kind of switch too quickly from formal to informal, from product speak to brand speak to uh, to to social media speak. Um, so you want to approach um, your 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 web elements while you've already kind of established your um, uh, how shall I put it, uh, kind of your 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 guide to uh, uh, voice and tone of your product and your brand. And obviously the right length for the purpose. Notice I've, I've written the right length, not long or short. Uh, some pages need to be three sections long. Some pages need to be 30 sections long. It all depends on what those pages are meant to serve. For example, uh, one of the most popular pages on Elementor.com is something we call slash features, which is a feature index that is, I don't know if I would have to print it on paper how long it would be, but it is quite long. It takes several scrolls to reach the bottom. However, we've we've scratched our heads and we've looked left and we've looked right. And, you know, that was the most effective way uh, to present uh, the, the depth and breadth of all the features that our product have. Uh, and we're not alone in that. Most companies uh, with, uh, with deep products that serve a variety of um, uh, of, of personas um, do so. They have uh, areas on the websites that are longer because that serves the purpose. Uh, a marketing landing page can be two or three sections long because all you need is a main call to action and a main reason to click forward. Uh, so kind of things that uh, you might want to, uh, to keep an eye out for. <clears throat> um, so let's uh, uh, kind of go through, and I'm kind of looking at the clock. I see we have about 15-ish um, uh, minutes to go. Um, okay, so, so what's in an effective uh, feature page? How do we approach breaking down a, a feature or a unique value proposition of the product that stems from a feature or a combination of features, uh, how do we break it down into an effective page? Um, so as we said, bold, coherent hero section with the number one unique value proposition. Uh, I'm not going to go through the process of how you distill your number one unique value proposition. Um, might do a different uh, workshop on, on that at some point. Uh, but ultimately, through a, a very rigorous uh, process of uh, user interviews, of interviewing different stakeholders, of trying out the product and trying out the competitors, uh, you should have arrived with your number one value proposition. So this is a screenshot taken from uh, our uh, uh, editor feature page. So uh, one of the more prominent pages that is both, that both it kind of tries to encapsulate our core product and also our core uh, value, which is the fact that our product is a drag and drop editor. Uh, and so build intuitively with our drag and drop editor. That was the number one value proposition. Get started as the main CTA, uh, a visual that supports that uh, of a hand kind of placing things in a, uh, in a Jenga tower that is a courtesy of our, uh, of our studio. Uh, this is, as I said, this needs to resonate with 100% of the people who, who view this page. They need to immediately understand why they're here. What is what is happening the soon they do this, sorry, this, with, with, with their mouse or their trackpad. Uh, what's next is, uh, and, and that is, I guess, kind of where, you know, there, there are several schools of thought uh, for me within the view of one uh, of kind of one screen size, you want to you want to show your main UVP and your how that main UVP breaks down into three um, three kind of main product benefits that support that, uh, which we call triple A. So below a hero section, you would have kind of these three items that breaks down the break down the uh, the main 
value proposition. So we have live editing, we have pixel perfect design and powerful assets. Those three are in support of this. Uh, this also serves as a kind of a speed bump for people to hover over for a second and to provide context for what's about to come next. Uh, and then various lengths uh, and various a, a number of items, you start to list your product benefits. Usually I approach this from what I feel is most universal and covers most use cases. And I go, a, a, you know, more and more niche uh, and more and more advanced as, as I move down the page. So you start with intuitive editing and then you go further into custom breakpoints, which is slightly more advanced. Uh, and then you start introducing complementary features. Uh, so you have dedicated areas, uh, contextual areas in the page that um, that present and showcase actual features. And you know, we're here we're showing UI uh, so that users who have experienced this page know how to you know what to look for. Um, advanced use cases is something that we usually kind of pull out and 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 make a specific case out of, um, and that's something that kind of um, follows a, a what you know what would be something that most people would use. Uh, so we talk about speed and performance. We talk about open source stuff that relevant that is relevant for a smaller a, a target, a feature grid, which is kind of like everything else we wanted to say and couldn't find a place for. <laughs> this is a, this is a, 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 a regular kind of go-to cheat that a product marketers and marketers in general use uh, in which you say, you know, we've kind of listed the main product benefits, the main unique value propositions, but we have like 20 more features lying around, stuff that are important that we want to uh, we want to showcase, uh, and so and you know comes the feature grid to the rescue, which is a dedicated section in most feature pages that uh, that that groups together all of the let's call them like miscellaneous or uh, uh, rudimentary uh, features that don't really fit in any other uh, under any other category. Um, social proof, testimonials, testimonials are a little controversial. Uh, I have kind of yet to form an opinion, uh, and, you know, uh, uh, a foolproof opinion about testimonials. Sometimes they, they do the job. Sometimes they feel fluffy. Uh, I think, uh, in a lot of cases, uh, uh, web visitors are blind to them by now. I don't know if people actually sit down and read, but because at least I can speak, uh, uh, you know, I, I can attest to our own testimonials that they are all, in fact, uh, genuine. Um, we actually are very fortunate to have a product that is extremely loved and used. And we have 10 minutes to go, so I'm going to speed up a little bit. Uh, and I send off uh, to kind of talk about what's ahead and what's next and where I want to take users from where they are now. Uh, to their next destination. This, for example, it can be a, a page that offers complementary information and is the next step in the journey uh, of the story I want to tell them. Or the next step is usually either, uh, you know, an opportunity to sign up, to purchase, uh, to enter a funnel of sorts. Um, this is kind of where, you know, where, where the website and the product uh, blend together. Uh, and so this is a checklist. We've just covered this. I'm going to skip over that because I want to spend a few minutes uh, talking about how we reimagined Elementary.com and how we use that as an op as, as an opportunity not only to develop a new brand uh, and and design language, uh, but also to uh, fully own uh, the, the the website product and the funnels that it generates. As part of the, uh, as part of the product marketing team, uh, so if you went to elementor.com uh, prior to June eighth, two thousand twenty-one, this is what you saw. This was uh, the look and feel that Elementor had uh, since its inception. Uh, and on the other side, uh, you have this. Actually, 
caveat if you go to elementary.com now this isn't what you will see the problem is i was making this presentation in the last week while we were doing uh, when we were having a black friday sale and for the life of me i couldn't find an updated <laughs> an updated visual uh, of our homepage uh, without black friday so, uh, so this is a, a one of um, uh, an earlier draft uh, but uh, this is exactly what uh, what you would find uh, written and displayed um, so we've moved from this, the world leading WordPress website builder, uh, something that was very, very important to communicate and showing a, a kind of very hardcore product demo below uh, to something that is that, that talks a lot more uh, softly and a lot more holistically uh, about the vision and about uh, where we are headed uh, and, and talks less about where we are placed inside uh, um, a larger ecosystem. Uh, and naturally also the, the look and feel is something that can't be ignored. And so we set out to tell our story, to engage our visitors and to match our new branding. Ultimately, we've worked very hard on creating a, a new brand uh, and new, uh, new typography, new color scheme, new uh, uh, visual language, uh, which had to play out uh, inside our website uh, and so we kind of we we broke it down a uh, bit by bit uh, the home page was obviously a, a massive challenge it's it's it is said that the pricing page is uh, is owned by marketing the feature pages is owned by product or product marketing the home page is owned by the ceo uh, usually the content uh, the order in which the content appears the language the the stats uh, the hierarchy is usually determined uh, by the CEO, by the person who calls most of the shots in the company. Uh, and I can attest to our own uh, CEO, uh, Yoni Luxemburg, who is a web designer by trade. Uh, that is how he came about found, uh, founding and, and, and uh, creating Elementor, uh, that um, this was done in full partnership. And down to choosing, uh, you know, choosing our statement, the H1 of the of the homepage, create websites, design your future was something that was chosen uh, in kind of full uh, democracy uh, and, and, and respect to everyone involved. Uh, and so the, the homepage is the entry point to our story and to the funnel as we've uh, covered uh, before. Uh, we, it was very, very important for us to demonstrate that we are a platform that is built for a variety of uh, users' persona and that it kind of, it, it comes pre, uh, pre-built and pre-baked uh, with abilities that can serve designers, developers, marketers, agencies, small businesses. And so we created dedicated pages that touch upon the various pain points of each one of these personas. If you look at elementor.com, you will find those under the four uh, 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 submenu. Um, we uh, introduced seven web creation pages in, in, in which we've taken Elementor, the product, and broke it down to seven main value propositions, which we've uh, packaged under web creation. Uh, so we've seen a little bit of our editor page, uh, improving workflow, uh, our dozens of widgets that we offer, our e-commerce capabilities, our marketing capabilities, the fact that we are a part of the WordPress ecosystem and everything we have for advanced users. Uh, all of these uh, enabled us to tell a very well-rounded and multifaceted story uh, for, um, for basically any use case that may, that may arise. Um, and these evergreen pages have since become very, very effective destinations for marketing campaigns and have become very effective in SEO because they actually create a messaging ring uh, around the product, capturing very uh, various intents uh, as, they, as they present themselves. Uh, we have obviously taken our, uh, our existing feature pages, which... Uh, you know, were created in very er in the very early stages of Elementor, and we redid them, reapproached them, rebriefed them, thought about them uh, in 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 kind of future facing uh, eyes, 
uh, and um, we are uh, still, uh, you know, the, the process is still ongoing. There are still a dozen more pages uh, that we are working on uh, and adding more. Uh, and of course, we can't forget uh, our pricing pages, uh, entry points to the purchase flow, uh, and uh, how they were used to highlight uh, main reasons to purchase, um, everything that happens below the comparison table, reasons to believe, stuff to expect. Um, also a very, very delicate area uh, with a lot of stakeholders involved, uh, designed our footer menu. Oh, forgot to, to add a slide about our header menu. Um, basically, this was an, uh, this was an endeavor uh, that re uh, resulted in uh, putting together, a, a, I want to say, about 40 to 50 people uh, in kind of an, an agency mode. Um, and uh, within three months, uh, we were able to launch about 30 new website pages from scratch while developing everything that, we've, that you've seen uh, on the go, uh, and these slides. Also, I want to uh, just to 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 give to give credit where credit is due. Those the the, the slides that you've just seen about uh, our own case study uh, were uh, were written by a member of my team, Sarah Nellison, uh, who was the leading uh, product marketer on this project. Uh, and I actually think I am done on time. Well done. Uh, so thank you very much for listening. Um, I, if there are any questions from the audience, uh, I can spare several minutes to answer them and then I really have to go. We actually want more, however. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, cannot do something about that. Okay, we actually have a couple of questions. Uh, sure. We have one question saying that, uh, where do you draw the line between? <laughs> This is a good one. The responsibilities of marketing and product marketing. I think we got that. We get that like every day now. Pretty much, we get that every day. Yes, that is. I mean, um, okay. oof, I don't know if I can answer that question in a minute or less, but I I can try and answer it very very uh, uh, simplistically. And and whoever you are, you can look me up on LinkedIn or Facebook, and uh, we can have a longer discussion about it. The way I see it, product marketing. Uh, owns the user's journey and experience uh, beyond the point of sign up. Uh, so essentially, uh, it's about retention. It is about cross-sell and upsell. It is about uh, stickiness of the product and communicating product benefits while the person is actually using the product. Marketing is about bringing those users in. Um, a lot of the times, the lines are blurred when marketing is relying on product benefits to bring those users in. And then product marketing has to step in and to advise a lot of the time, sometimes even to be uh, hands-on uh, in marketing efforts, top of funnel uh, and all of that. That is as, as quick as I can answer that. Okay, I have one of my own actually, a bit sure. more cars perhaps. Where do you draw the line between product marketing and product management? Oh. Loving that. Uh, actually, that is a much clearer line to draw, uh, and I can t I can use my uh, favorite metaphor uh, that I've uh, uh, prepared for for that. Uh, product management, the product organization, is responsible for building Disneyland. Okay, they are building the the most exciting, best uh, ever Disneyland that was ever built. However, they build Disneyland on an island. Five kilometers <laughs> offshore. If you stand on the beach, you see Disneyland. If you really, really, really want to go to Disneyland, you will swim to Disneyland. 99% of people will not swim to Disneyland. For those people, we sell tickets to the ferry and we operate the ferry. So that is pro product marketing is all about creating anticipation and creating a, a and, and building a sentiment around the product. And, mm -hmm. and Basically, a lot of the times, saving product managers from themselves um, by smoothing out some of the edges uh, that uh, product market product managers overlook uh, in the pursuit of uh, getting stuff to work. Uh, I think that our fellow PMs will be excited by this uh, statement right now. I think. <laughs> <Come on>. Okay. <laughs> I think. Yeah. I mean. 
Yeah, well, there, is, there are many questions there. Where you draw the line? Where should mm -hmm. product marketing be? You know, under should it be under marketing or should it be under product? Should it be something different? I mean, there are many layer lines there currently. Uh, but I don't want to keep you for the whole afternoon because I guess you have <laughs> also to attend something else. Uh, we have another one. Hey, uh, what is your POV regarding medical services nutritionist websites? Should the business focus on, on highlight the service or the personnel offering it to achieve an initial familiarization with the audience? Um, that is a very difficult question because I, I know that this is a, a, a terribly regulated uh, field in which you know more about what you can't say than what you can say. Um, I, 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 I don't think I have a, I have a, a, an easy response for that. I would always, and, and I mean, you know, this is obviously it's product marketing, but uh, from a different angle, I was, I will always focus on where a product benefit meets a, a persona. Usually it's, it, it, it's, it's a, it's a very elusive point. Um, but you start with my product does this, or by using my product, this happens to you. And then you start thinking who the you is. So if you are, uh, I don't know, um, uh, 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 men in their sixties, then what, then, then the, this, it becomes clear. If you are women trying to conceive, then this becomes clear what this does. Uh, and again, I know that for the, the nutrition and, med, and, and medicinal industry, uh, there's a lot about what you can't say and claims and like I've, I've been there in the previous life. So good luck with that. Again, if you want, feel free to look me up on LinkedIn. Uh, I'll be very, very happy to answer those questions. Unfortunately, I do have to leave uh, and I've had an absolute blast. Thank you, Despina, for always. Sorry for our uh, pleasure for, to have you. For, 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 for having it, yeah. For, for dragging me uh, by you know by the fingernails, I I, I ended up making it. Uh, and hope that uh, it's hope our pleasure that was, uh, again. Uh, we are way a bit over time, so thank you all for watching. Uh, for those asking, our sessions of course will be on demand. However, not on the free plan. You will have to upgrade and take the on demand plan in order to watch Jonathan and so many other leaders on demand again and again. We're actually hopping on in uh, soon again with the next session. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. Welcome back to PLD Disrupt. We are now on stage with Pietro Lanza from IBM, who is going to talk to us about how to leverage and exponential technologies to improve customer experience via the IBM point of view. Pietro, hi. We are happy to have you. Hello, good afternoon, and thanks for inviting me. Uh, the pleasure is all ours. Um, shall we actually begin? We're a bit overdue, so we would need to, you know, move quickly. Uh, would you like to start and, you know, tell us in a few words what you would like to present to us today? Yes, I I brought here a couple of uh, use cases and I uploaded a PowerPoint. I don't know if it's possible to project it with two video clip. Otherwise, yeah, sure. The stage is actually okay. all yours. I will be behind the scenes and talk to you in a while. Okay, thank you very much. Let's see if this is working. Actually, I don't see the, the video. Can you try to send the IBM PPT that I uploaded here, if possible, otherwise we do without, we go without. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, do you have a, do you have it handy? Do you think you can connect your drive? Uh, we have many no, options. No, it's uploaded, it's uploaded here in the platform. I see it says IBM PPT. Otherwise I can uh, just project from, uh, from uh, my... Yeah. But I think that would be better, if possible. Okay. Give me just one second. Okay. Okay. Uh, Pietro, you may start, actually. Pietro? Yes. Yes. Do you want to start, perhaps? Uh, yes, I, I'm sending a video. I don't know if you can see it. Yes, we're seeing the video. Do you want to start explaining to the audience what this is about? Pietro, can you hear me? Can you hear us? Can you still hear us? Pietro? Pietro, can you hear us? Can you see the video? Yes. Can do you want to start presenting? Yeah, but the video is going on my Mac. Anyway, problem, probably there are some problems, so let me explain it uh, to okay. you. So The stage is... Oh, okay, the stage thank is you very more. much. Thank you. So first of all, let me introduce the new strategy of IBM as we are changing a lot of our business model and this has an impact on uh, what we are using to leverage uh, our capabilities and improve customer experience uh, for our clients. Uh, we are going to be more and more a technology company as uh, we spin off all what we call managed services. So basically IBM is now based on two business units. One is IBM Consulting, the other one is IBM Technology. And what is relevant uh, to enhance and to improve the customer experience is capabilities in both of our business units. So in IBM Technologies, we are going to focus more and more on what we call exponential technologies like cloud computing, IoT, artificial intelligence, blockchain and security. And uh, on the IBM consulting side, we have all the professional services that are helping our clients normally mid and big enterprises to modernize their infrastructure and to adopt more and more these exponential technologies in order to transform 
their, uh, let's say, uh, platforms and to offer better digital services to the final customers. I brought here two examples, even if we uh, cannot uh, see the video clips of how we are changing two main industries. One is oil and gas, the other one is retail. Uh, for instance, the, um, the projects that I use this use case for retail industry is based on a cooperation uh, between IBM and Samsung, where we are using and leveraging on our Watson AI capabilities. And on the other side, uh, all the, let's say, advertising and display capabilities uh, of Samsung in order to offer uh, a very focused customer experience in retail, uh, which is able to interact and proactively propose um, let's say uh, sales uh, suggestions to the clients in many different ways. So uh, these examples is based on one of the exponential technologies that I mentioned before, that is artificial intelligence, and we call Watson, uh, let's say, uh, ecosystem, all the tools that are uh, more and more allow any kind of industry like retail in this case to interact in a different way uh, with what we call augmented intelligence, um, more than um, artificial intelligence, in order to offer more uh, capabilities both to the enterprises and to their final clients. Uh, this, for instance, is very much used in uh, other industries like financial services, where uh, given also the current situation, uh, we have faced a period where the customer experience was uh, mostly based on digital interaction with uh, the service provider. In this case, I'm talking about financial industries, for instance, and we have seen a, a huge growth in the adoption of uh, digital tools of interaction like chatbots, for instance, that uh, allowed to some way substitute the um, human interaction that was not possible or very strictly, uh, let's say, uh, limited in the, in the last 18 months. So basically, uh, we are trying to um, build very quickly, also thanks to what we call design thinking capabilities, new processes, new digital interactions between the enterprise and the final customers um, with very fast MVP uh, leveraging, as I said, on design thinking for the concept and then um, agile and the books when we move to the developments of new applications. And this uh, allow all the um, mid and large enterprise to be very fast, very effective on what we develop and together in a common team and also to improve very quickly and to correct very quickly uh, the, the digital interactions that are developed uh, time by time. Um, so this is going in the direction of uh, uh, having very uh, short projects and maybe um, to, as I said, improve the applications in different waves other than wait six to 12 months for a larger project uh, and miss the opportunity to develop a new um, digital customer experience for the, for the, for the final customers. Uh, just to make an example, um, we are focusing a lot on also enablers of digital experience. And one of them is uh, for sure everything under digital identity concept, which means the possibility to uh, recognize remotely and make sure that the identity of a final customer is, uh, is uh, safely recognized. And uh, this can allow uh, any service provider that uh, requires a, a proof of identity to offer a new digital customer experience and remote customer experience to to the final user um, allowing to bring most of the processes that were based on human interaction on a new digital experience. So um, to recap, uh, we are on one side working on some building blocks like digital identity and uh, new infrastructure, cloud native, 
in order to be fast and to leverage on, uh, let's say, pre-built uh, blocks that uh, allows the service providers of any industry to be uh, very, very quick in the deployment of new digital services. On the other side, we are leveraging capabilities like artificial intelligence in order to comprehend uh, and to fastly adapt to the, let's say, needs that the, the customers have to have on new uh, digital way to interact with their service providers. And uh, this is also thanks to the um, uh, big data analysis. And this brings to uh, a, a customer experience that is uh, some way uh, based on machine learning and uh, adapting very quickly uh, to uh, new needs and new way of interacting that are really pushed uh, to the limit, uh, were pushed to the limit, as I said, in the last 18 months, especially in uh, um, part of the populations that were not so used to interact digitally with their service providers. I'm talking about, for instance, elderly people. And so this is very important because we are uh, now targeting a very large audience, uh, larger and larger, very close to 100% uh, of the population. And so from the beginning of the concept and the design of the new customer experience and customer interactions, we have to make sure that the usability is really pushed to the limit in the meaning that uh, it's accessible to all the uh, layers of populations, you know, the customer in, I mean, in terms of customer base, um, to to uh, make sure that the benefits uh, reach, uh, let's say, the highest percentage possible of um, the population of a certain industry or, or a certain enterprises. Um, on the other side, to introduce uh, another capability that we are leveraging more and more. Um, we are introducing in several of these projects um, blockchain, for instance, and this allows to uh, offer, um, let's say, new features in, ter in terms of customer experience based, for instance, on uh, some core value of these technologies. I'm referring to DLT and blockchain once again like uh, transparency and trust. So these two pillars, transparency and trust, are naming uh, more and more interactions, especially on a certain industry. Some for sure uh, can put on top of the list financial services, but also uh, food, fashion. So wherever the uh, transparency of the supply chain or the transparency of the, let's say, service offered is important for the final customers. And this is adding, this kind of technologies are adding a, uh, an additional layer of trust. And um, this is some way uh, fostering the interaction on some transactions that were uh, not so easy to address with previous, um, with previous technology. So we are very deep involved in every kind of projects uh, that is regarding customer experience. Uh, it's a mix of process industry knowledge, uh, evolution of single industries, where they're going, and technologies. So um, we, we have to mix and we do it every day, all these ingredients in order to bring something new, something very easy to use, and something that is, as I said, adapting very fastly based on the behaviors and new behaviors of the customers and also the new customers that were not used to uh, interact uh, digitally with their enterprises. Um, and this is bringing benefits. We see this in very, uh, I mean, in a large uh, part of the, the enterprises that especially uh, 2021 have uh, achieved, uh, let's say, important results in terms of uh, profits, also based on the uh, on leveraging uh, new technologies, on leveraging digitals, and this is why we have never been as busy as in the last 18 months supporting uh, our clients in the adoption of this technology. Um, I'd uh, 
stop here. Uh, I don't know if there are any questions from. Uh, Hi, again. So uh, I think we don't have any questions right now from the audience. Uh, we okay. can perhaps wrap this up. Thank you so much, Pietro. This was extremely useful. And uh, please meet us in 20 minutes or so back with Bernard Slowly from Salesforce, where we're going to host another crash course on customer experience. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Hello everyone, welcome back to Build This Lab. We are extremely happy to have with us Bernard Slowly from Salesforce, the VP of Digital Customer Support, who will explain to us uh, what else, uh, how Salesforce actually excels customer experience and uh, what learnings we can take from their practices. Bernard, the stage is yours. Uh, Great. Hello everyone. Welcome back to Building This Lab. We are extremely happy to have with us Bernard Slope. Okay, I think it's time for me to leave the stage. <laughs> Is it working okay? You can hear me okay? Yeah, it's fine. Awesome. Great. Uh, hey, thank you. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. As Lucy said, my name is Bernard Slowly. I'm the Vice President for Digital Customer Support at Salesforce. I'm going to talk to you today about how we deliver a seamless digital support experience. I'm going to talk you through six steps that we use to approach it. And hopefully there's something valuable you can take out of that that might be useful for you and your journey. I'm also going to probably answer the question, why support? We're at a product growth session. Why am I talking about support? So I hope to answer that question by the end. I got about 20 minutes worth of content um, and then hopefully we can open it up for some questions at the end. So hopefully you got some great questions. All right. So a little bit, first of all, I just want to say a massive thank you and gratitude. I know it's late in the day for many of you. I think this might be the second last session. So I really appreciate you staying connected and, and, and listening in and learning through this. So I hope there's something valuable you get out of it. A little bit about me. Um, I'm actually month eight at Salesforce. I'm pretty new in my Salesforce career. Incredibly happy to be here. Previously to that, I spent a year at GitHub where I led our digital customer success and support organization. And before that, I spent 14 years at Microsoft where I had a number of leadership roles. I was the worldwide leader for Windows consumer support. So I drove support over 130 markets, about 3000 agents in-house and outsource. So if you look at my areas of expertise, strong support delivery, I've spent a lot of time there. I really love that so a lot of expertise there but really my passion is around digital customer support and and what does that mean it's about enabling customers to self-serve i know i don't think anybody wakes up in the morning and says i want to contact support they're going to go to google they're going to go to youtube they're going to search how do you make that a great experience and that's what we're going to talk about today and i think that's a cornerstone pillar in any cx transformation Hobbies and interests, I love to run where I can find the time. I think to COVID, I certainly started running a little bit more. Uh, I like to watch soccer and rugby is what I would say, definitely not playing. And I live in Seattle in the Pacific Northwest, so beautiful hiking area where I get the time. But honestly, most of the time is spent with my family. You can see there my little guy, Dylan, who's four and a half. That half is very important to him. My wife, Laura, and my dog, Brooke. So that's, that's my happy spot. And as you might have guessed by the accent, I'm Irish, but living in the US for 11 years. So that's a little bit about me. So let's jump in. Let's talk about these six steps. So the first step is what's your why? And what do I mean by that? We spend a lot of time at Salesforce looking at external data, looking to the industry. And I'm going to share some data points here with you, both external and internal. The first one is from um, a Forbes, which is that 96% of customers would leave a company due to bad customer service. 96%. It's a crazy number. But yet, when you think about it, it probably resonates with you. You can think about that terrible experience you had and why you might leave that company. In the middle, these two data points are from Salesforce state of the service service report, 91% of customers say good service makes them more likely to purchase. So the flip side, if they have a good experience, they're more likely to purchase. And then 80% of customers say service experience is as important as the product. So when you think about product growth, Gone are the days when we could think about support as just a cost of goods sold and it wasn't important. It's a critical element of the product. Your customers think about support as part of your product and you need to provide a support experience to enable that. And at Salesforce, we spend a lot of time with Gartner. And what you can see over on the right-hand side, this comes from Gartner, that 70% of customers try self-service during their resolution journey. And resolution being, I have a problem, I go try and solve it but yet only 9% are resolved. And that's a shocking, shocking number. But that shows you the opportunity in order to drive a great digital support experience. And that's where my team is focused. That's where I'm focused. We invested in Salesforce in creating a team to focus really around this online digital experience. So this is our why, right? We, we, we looked at the data, you know, you can see where the industry's going. And it's really important to us that we provide a world-class support experience for our customers. The second thing that we did was we went and understood our customer's journey. Now, don't worry. I don't expect you to be able to see the text on this visual. It's more just so you can get an understanding of what we did. But 
you have to understand your customer's journey today. What do I mean by that? We partnered with a company called Round Feather, and what they did is they done a full journey map of all of the touch points that our customers have as they get through support. So you can see kind of over on the left-hand side, where you probably can't see it, it's, it's around self-help, engaging with support, getting into assisted support, going through different tiers of assisted support, going into engineering. It's a very complex ecosystem. And what it showed us was what's the failure points? Where are customers having problems? Because if you don't understand the customer's journey today, then how can you go drive a world-class journey? You have to understand what it is. You have to put the time and effort into understanding what it is so that you can improve it. So that's the second step we went through. And we did this work about, about two years ago, two years, 18 months ago with this company called called Round Feather. Then out of that, the next thing you have is define your strategy. And our strategy at Salesforce support is really simple, easy, low effort and high speed, expert, product depth and user context. What do we mean by this? Everything we do in Salesforce support comes back to this strategy, easy and expert. And it sounds simple, but as we all know, to simplify the complex is not easy. It takes a lot of brain power, a lot of work that goes into it, but we wanna have a very simple strategy around how we, how we do this. So I'll give you some examples of what I mean. So easy, low speed and high effort. If I talk about the digital self-help experience, we wanna make it easy from a customer to get through self-help to assisted support. Minimize the clicks, don't get in their way, make it easy for them to get to assisted support. We want it to be high speed. We want our, our page to load fast. We want it easy for customers to experience things. And then on the expert side, if you think about the digital self-help experience, we want to make sure we're providing product depth and user context. So what that means is that if we have someone who's maybe quite new in their Salesforce journey, we want to provide them help and help how to content that's relevant to them versus maybe a IT admin who's very tenured, we want to pry them deep technical content like release notes. So that's what we mean by that product depth and user context on the self-help side. And then on the assisted side, we want to make sure we get you to the right engineer to solve your issue first time. He or she has product depth in that product. So that's what we did. The second was we understood the journey our customers went on, and then we defined it, our strategy and what it meant for us to deliver world-class. The next step is something that my team then did is we double clicked down on this. And what we did was we built what we would call digital support tenants. And you can think about these as principles. Tenants is a word that's often used in the industry. Amazon is very famous for that. And what we have is we have five tenants that we look at for digital support. And how I think about this is your tenants or your principles, these are the things that you come back to when you're having the candid conversations. When you're having the disagreements about something that you wanna do for your customer, your tenants should center you on how you make them decisions. So the first one for us is this federation of digital channels. And you'll see later on, I'll talk about some of the channels that we do support in, but what we're talking about here is that we connect experiences across the customer's digital journey. So what I mean is we have support available in YouTube. People can watch videos. They can go to our community. They can go to our help portal. And it's important we offer them digital channels, but we want to make sure that the journey customers go through them channels is consistent. It's, it's personalized and consistent through them channels. And how we do that is with the second, the second tenant, which is around guided experiences. And this is about building journeys that help customers to the best asset to solve their issue. And what I mean by asset is it could be a YouTube video that is really good at solving that issue. It could be a knowledge article. It could be a bot. It depends on the scenario. It depends on the topic. And we want to guide the customer to the right thing to solve for that. The third one is around know me. And what this is, is about using applicable data to drive a personalized experience. We all have data on our customers. Obviously we're all PII, uh, following the PII standards, but things I mean here is that when a customer logs into our help portal, we wanna provide them a personalized experience. We're showing them products that only apply to them. We're showing them stages that they're in on the journey on new content that they can go to learn, to understand, to educate. And then the next one is around customers helping customers. We're incredibly lucky at Salesforce. We have an amazing community of trailblazers. And what we've done is we've built out a community to enable them trailblazers to help other trailblazers. And any, you know, any company, any product, these are the raving fans that you want to engage. These are the people that love your product. And how can you use them to help build up your community, to have your community help community? So that's one of our tenants. And then the final tenant is this slick handoff. 
So when digital doesn't work, the customer is passed to a support engineer with context. You've all had the experience, right? You've been online, you've looked at some content, and then you went to engage with chat or whatever or call for whatever that company is. And the agent starts with, what is your problem? It's super frustrating, right? So what we want to do is make sure that our agents get a synopsis of that digital experience that you've had so that they can start the qu with, oh, I see you're having a problem on X and I see you've done steps A, B, and C. And then they continue the journey, not starting it all over again. And I'll give you one example for me where personally this went very wrong for me recently. And I apologize if there's anyone from Uber on the call, but I had an experience with Uber where I needed to change something on my bill. Um, on the app, they have a bot. It was very, very difficult to work it. It just kept putting me through a loop and a loop and a loop. And I couldn't get to a human. It was impossible to get to a human. I had to go on Twitter. I had to broadcast on Twitter, tag them, and then eventually a support engineer engaged with me over Twitter. And then I have to explain to them what my problem is. That's the exact opposite of a slick handoff. And, that, and that's coming back to them data points earlier on, it certainly put a bad perception for me on Uber um, and going forward. Okay, so that was the next step around our digital support tenants. I hope this is making sense so far. And as I said, we'll have time for questions at the end. The next thing is enable the right channels for your customers. So what you're looking at here is you can see from Salesforce, we look from digital support all the way across to assisted. And in digital support, we have our help portal that's on, on, um, on Experience Cloud, excuse me. And that's a mobile first experience. You can see the example of it there in the, in the iPhone. We have Trailhead where customers can go learn about our products and become educated on them. We have YouTube. We have a support channel on YouTube where we've help and how-to videos. I mentioned earlier on, we have an incredible Trailblazer community where we have customers helping customers. We have social support. We do support in Twitter and LinkedIn. We broadcast content as well as help customers one-to-one. -one. We have phone, we have live chat, and we have online case submission. And so for us, we're a very mature company. We want to be where our customers are. And so we have these support across different channels. Depending on where you are on your journey, you might not need this many channels. In fact, I think sometimes companies have too many and they don't manage them correctly. You might be better off starting with one or two and making sure you're managing them to the level you need be. But the next part, and this is really, really important, is when you have them channels, is you now need to build journey maps. This kind of comes back to them personalized experiences for your top issues. And I'm gonna explain what I mean by this. I'm just gonna pause for a second and get a little bit of water. So the first thing I would say is personas. Personas are so important. Not everybody who uses your product is the same persona. At Salesforce, we have a set of personas, one of which is this accidental admin, Kathy. And you can see with Kathy, right? My boss asked if I wanted to help with Salesforce. And I said, sure, thinking it would be like a two week project. Two years later, Kathy is the Salesforce admin. So she's what we would call an accidental admin. So what we do is we take these personas. So this example, this accidental admin, Kathy, we look at our top issues in assisted support and we journey map them out to understand the journey that Kathy's going through and where we can drive improvements. So if you look at this journey milestones, we look at what's the in-product experience. So, and I'll show you some examples of this in a second. So for example, is there an error message in the product? What's the solution deliver, solution discovery? How does she find a solution to her problem? How do, what, how do we give her a solution? Is it a video, is it content? How do we confirm that solution is working? Does it have a thumbs up, thumbs down so we can know if yes or no that it's working? And then assisted support, how does she go through to assisted support? So we look at these questions. We look at that current customer experience. As I said, we look at in product. How does the customer know they have an issue? We look at the touch points. Is there any in-app self-help options for the customer, right? You've, that experience of, hey, I get an error message in, in my product and that links to self-help, right? That's the best way to have it. It's direct and in the product. And we also look at the pain points in the experience. And this is a simple smiley face, sad face, no, and just a plain face. I lost the word there for that, but you know what I mean. And so what we're looking at is, is this a good experience or not, right? And then we get to the solution discovery and we look at what does this persona do to find a solution? And we know that generally accidental admins like Kathy will start in Google. So we look at Google, how is the SEO for this issue? Is it performing well? SEO being search engine optimization. Is it performing well? Is Google giving the relevant content that we wanted to give in its list? 
And then we're looking at, does the right solution exist for the issue, right? Sometimes we mightn't have a solution and we need to go build new content, new solution for that issue. Does it perform well, right? As I mentioned earlier on, a lot of our content, we have a thumbs up, thumbs down to see is it performing well or not. And then that final step, <clears throat> excuse me, is it easy? Coming back to that easy, right? Is it easy for the customer to create a case? We want to make it as simple as possible. We don't want to hide behind clicks and screens. If Kathy wants to create a case, we want to make that as easy as possible. So there's a lot in this slide and trust me that journey mapping is an exercise in customer empathy. You got to take a long time at it. We have roles in our team called digital program managers. They spend a lot of time building out these detailed journey maps on our top issues so we can identify where we improve. Okay, so now you've built some journey maps, you've got your channels in place. The next thing, and this is where I find that companies often fail on digital, is how do you operationalize digital KPIs? When I say digital, I mean digital support in this scenario. <clears throat> I, as I mentioned earlier on, we work with Gartner a lot, and I partner with Gartner, and this came from Gartner. And I'm going to kind of walk you through this, and then I'll go into detail on some of them. So up the top, you have what we call our digital support strategic KPIs. And I'll walk through each one of these and explain them in a minute. But what you can see then in the middle is we have our channels. As I mentioned earlier on, we have community, our help portals, social, YouTube. They're the kind of digital channels that we're looking at. And then down the bottom, you have our content, the types of content we deliver across these channels, whether it's an article, whether it's a video, whether it's a community post, whether it's a social post. And then that yellow line down the bottom, the top volume drivers journey optimization, that comes back to the previous slide where we're understanding our top drivers in assisted support and building journeys across these channels to get customers to the best solution. So this is the kind of framework at a high level. And I'll talk about the strategic KPIs because what I often find with people, especially in support, they're very operational. There's a lot of metrics for support worlds like uh, average handle time, you know, CSAT, et cetera, but we don't seem to bring that same rigor to digital. And that's what we do in my team. So what you can see is we have digital CSAT. And basically what we're looking at here is the customer satisfaction, the experience that the customer is having within these channels. Self-help success, this is kind of our uber success metric. And what this looks at is as a simple example, if we look at our help portal, we're looking at the customer came to the portal, they saw a piece of content and they didn't create a case. That's deemed a self-help success, yes. And that gives us like a quality metric. And the next one is what we call self-help usage rate. And what we're looking at here is we take the monthly active users of a product, product A, and we look at all of the self-help usage we have for that product and we're dividing them against each other. And I, I have the next slide will visualize this a little bit better for you. But ultimately what you get is you get a percentage, like a self-help usage rate 10%. Why is that important? That gives you a quality metric for your product. For your product, If one product has a very high self-help usage rate and another one has a low self-help usage rate, product A has a problem. Why do so many customers need to go get self-help? They can't find it, they can't understand how to do things in the product. So it gives us data to work with our engineering teams on. And then the final one is around total problems resolved. And again, I'll, I'll visualize this in the next slide, but this is looking across all of our channels. How do we show the amount of people we solve digitally? And this is a great metric when you come back to ROI. You know, when you're presenting to C-suite execs and you need to get investment in digital, you can show the amount of people that you're resolving in your digital channels. So that's our strategic KPIs. We do have a lot of KPIs that we manage operationally under each of these channels. I'm not going to go into what, every one of these in detail because I want to make sure I have time for questions. But just to give you an example, I'm going to pick on the help portal and show you some things we look at. As I mentioned earlier on, we look at our SEO. How is, we have an SEO experience manager. Her job is looking at how SEO is performing. Are we getting people to the right content on our help portal? We look at our authentication rate. If we drive our authentication rate up, more people get a personalized experience. <clears throat> we look at search performance on our help portal. It's a search first experience. We use a partner called Caveo. We look at how is that performing? Are customers finding their answers when they search? And then we look at site performance, things like load times, you know, how fast is the site loading? So I'm just gonna pause for one second and get another sip of water. So there, there's a lot in this slide. I realized that and I was kind of, should I show this or not? But what I wanted to show you was, the rigor that we put around digital support. And hopefully there's something for you to think about as you think about your business. But here's a great way to visualize this. 
it's called the digital support funnel, right? And what you have on the left-hand side is your total monthly active users for your product. And then beside that, you have this self-help usage rate. And this is what I said, we're sitting, if you look at the formula down the bottom, all it is is we're taking the unique visitors we have across our self-help assets each month for that product, our channel, sorry, excuse me, <clears throat> and we're dividing it by our mail. And that gives you a percentage. And then you look at the total problems resolved, all this is is we're looking at that self-help success metric and we're multiplying it by our unique visitors each month for that product. And then we look at our case rate, how many customers have to create a case. And again, it's the cases created divided by our mail. And what you can see you get real clear is you have this visual now of support, right? The amount of customers using your product, the amount of customers engaging with self-help, and the amount of customers drive to assisted support. And we go through this every month. We look at our trends. We look at where we can improve. Okay, so I'm nearly finished. I think a minute or two, I want to make sure of time for questions. So kind of bringing it back a little bit to where we came from. So six steps, be clear on your why. Why do you want to do this, right? Why are you investing in this area? Be really, really clear on that. Understand the customer's journey today. If you don't understand the journey as it is today, then you can't improve. Define your strategy and your tenants, right? When you understand the journey, now build out your strategy and your tenants. Then enable the channels your customers want, right? Again, you might decide you only want to enable one or two. It depends on where you are in your journey. But then number five is that persona-based journey mapping. That's a rigor. That's a rigor you need to bring to digital support. And then finally, make sure you operationalize digital KPIs. We have weekly business reviews, monthly business reviews, where we're looking at these KPIs and managing the performance. So... The results, how has it gone for us? <clears throat> so we launched our new help portal on Experience Cloud, which is a Salesforce product. Um, just in August this year, we relaunched actually. And you can see an example of it here. You can see an example of some content within it. We have an 80% self-help rate for our authenticated users. I feel really, really good about that, 80%. We have a 70% decrease in abandonment rate. So we made it a better experience. And with that, less customers abandon the experience. 85% fewer steps to submit a case. Again, coming back to that easy, we want it to be simple for customers to submit a case. We don't want to get in their way. If they want to do that, let them do that. We increased the load time of the site, 39.7% improvements in load times. And we increased our authentication rate by 3x, which allows us to drive that more personalized experience. <clears throat> and coming back to them strategic KPIs, we launched a digital CSAT, a micro survey within the site that pops up moments within the journey. We partner with a company called Sprig to do that. And you can see some of the verbatim, right? Excellent experience, superb, superb. You know, 3.5 out of five. I don't feel great about that. It's okay, you know, but we want to definitely get up above four, but we're still early in our journey and working on that. Okay. So I think that was my final slide. Um, you know, a massive thank you. I hope there was something useful in here for you. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. You know, feel free to reach out to me. Give me feedback on LinkedIn. Follow me, friend, uh, you know, whatever you want to do. I'd love to hear from you. So with that, I think we're going to go back to some questions. Hello again. Thank you so much. That was hey. awesome. <laughs> So we have a question. Uh, it's uh, actually talked a lot about the customer journey. You talked a lot about the digital experience. We want to know how product data fit into that inside Salesforce and perhaps how customer support operational, operationalize on that. Okay, can you just repeat that for me one more time yeah. to make sure I answer it correctly? So uh, with product growth, we have a lot of data. The customer yes. journey is we revamp it end to end. Yeah, uh, you mentioned a lot of times about uh, many things about the customer journey, how you optimize mm -hmm. that internally. We want to know if uh, you know the customers, the digital support is actually taking advantage of product data to be deliver better insights for the customer journey for the long great run. Great question. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a great question. So, so the 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 nirvana of a digital support experience is it starts within product. So you, you have a you have a problem on your product and it's easy for you to get to self-help within the product or else and it's easy to get to you for to an agent or an engineer within the product. You don't have to leave. You don't have to go to Google. You don't have to search. You don't have to go to a company portal. So we partner a lot with our engineering teams, with our product teams around how we build 
in product self-help. So we look at the journey of, okay, customers are going to a certain place in the product. There's maybe some confusion there. We need to have some self-help content within the product. And so for, you know, customers can hover on a question mark in the top right-hand corner of a Salesforce product. From that, they can get to relevant content for that product. And it can also bring them into assisted support. Now, I will say we've room to grow there. We're looking at how we enable Einstein bot technology within the product. So we can have like a bot interface on certain scenarios, but we do partner extremely closely with our product teams to make sure that product and support is a seamless experience. They're not separate entities. We don't want to show our organizational seams to our customers. So we work very, very closely with them, understanding that data, because that data also helps us understand issues customers are having in order to go create new self-help solutions. Does that help answer the question? That helps a lot. <laughs> it clears a lot some points. Um, okay, that was the one question. The other question is uh, that you have done so, so many things internally to optimize the customer journey, to make the digital experience optimal as much as it can be, because it's not always in our hands. Uh, after all, we're humans. But uh, yes. how do you align? How do you achieve alignment with the rest of the customer-facing teams or the product teams internally in order to deliver that experience? That, that, that is, would be that a very is a fair question. question. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and yeah, for a long time in Microsoft, that's a question I understand very well as well. It, um, I'm trying to think, find the right words to write to answer this. It's such a great question because that alignment is critical. Like if you're not aligned across the company with your product teams, you know, your product engineering teams, your other teams, like for example, the team that produces our content or our CXX team is the acronym. They live in our engineering teams. We need to align with them. So for me, it comes back to being aligned at the leadership level. And we're, we're kind of coming back to that slide I showed you on them, them digital KPIs. Them KPIs, that funnel that I showed you, I present that out every month to the relevant leaders across the different functions in our organization. So we're all aligned on, yes, we're looking at the same KPIs and we're all aligned that we're bought in on them KPIs. They are the right KPIs to show that we're improving the experience. If you can get that alignment on the KPIs with the relevant leaders, and I do think it's up to the leaders because if the leaders don't Line, it's very difficult for the teams underneath to try and drive that alignment from bottoms up. But honestly, the needers need to align at the top. But you have to align around them KPIs. If you're not measuring the same things or you don't agree on what you're measuring and you have different KPIs, you'll never, ever be aligned. Now, of course, they'll have unique KPIs for the things they're doing in their businesses, but they want you want to make sure that they understand and are bought in on your KPIs. And okay, I think that the next question that would resonate here is uh, what about when you have many different KPIs? How do you actually align those to begin with? I mean, okay, custom uh, digital uh, support, customer success, sales, they have common touch points. However, this is a tad more difficult when it, we talk about the product team or the engineering team. Where do you begin yep. to put that together as a foundation, perhaps? Yeah, yeah, well, I think the foundation is mail, right? What it, monthly active users, right? Like for at least, you know, at Salesforce, right? Like at all companies, you're trying to grow the active usage of your product, right? Like that's the primary, whether you're, you're sales, whether you're engineering, whether you're support, the primary metric that it all comes back to is, are customers using your product and are more customers using it month over month over month? So you start to see that growth. Um, and then everything that you do comes back to that. It's kind of like that funnel I showed you earlier on. I don't have a metric for mail. That's not sits within my organization. Like you talked about it, you know, there's customer success teams, there's sales teams, there's engineering teams, but we can show data on how if we drive a really good support experience, like the CSAT is five out of five stars, that that influences the mail. It comes back to the metrics I showed from Forrester, from Gartner. If someone has a very bad support experience, they will leave your product and then you lose a customer, right? And who knows how many more customers you lose after that. So we don't have to necessarily have the same metrics. We each have our own metrics within support, success, engineering, but we all are marching in the same direction, right? We're all marching. How are we helping to drive that product growth? And how is the business that we're doing impact in that? And are all of the other teams understand the importance of support and the importance of customer satisfaction and the impact that that can have on your mouth? Yes, I think this is a good foundation to begin with. And we will have to wrap this up because we have our next session coming on. 
coming forward. Great. I want to only thank you so much for sharing these tremendous insights with us today. Uh, we're really looking forward to the next session uh, uh, to arrange it soon. And uh, I think that this time it's, time it's finally to close it. Thank you so much again for joining. Thank and, you. Uh, to all of you, our next session is on Product Led Engineering Foundation, hosted by Jordan Kolaropoulos. Please stay tuned. Thank you very much for the time. Really appreciate it. Have a great day. Likewise. <laughs>
is actually what builds your SaaS products and how it's imperative to the field journey instead of the necessary evil or just another cost center. So some uh, here I have four bullets around the uh, key structures and the structural changes and the mentality changes that need to happen. So it's first with great responsibility comes and comes in great power, right? So the thing is that engineers need to be engaged and they need to understand the product so that they can uh, equally participate in product design and delivery. Usually they participate only on the delivery, unfortunately. That means that we have to explain to them the new responsibilities that they need now to take in, in the PLG era, the processes that we need to put in place along with product, uh, customer success, sales, and engineering in order to drive vision and to drive the, the, the actual roadmap of the product. And also, that's how we need to understand that there shouldn't be two roadmaps. There shouldn't be your technical roadmap and your product roadmap. It should be one roadmap. Product builds a vision. Technology is the enabler of this vision. Uh, if I had to break it down on what we're going to talk about today, it's around how the engineering department needs to embrace the PLG principle, how the we can align uh, engineering with the rest of the company and how we can make them understand the product vision, how we integrate customer feedback into the actual development project process, sorry, and what is the continuous delivery and why it is important. So... First things first, in a PLG firm and every firm, we should try to break down the silos first. So most companies today need to answer a set of questions around how they operate, the ways in which they coordinate their work, the visibility of the roadmap, how everyone knows what we build, why we exist, why we're here. So culture is becoming increasingly important, especially the era of great resignation, as you all know, and especially in uh, yeah, post-COVID era, people tend to change or you know tend to search for another job. So having a culture that's strong, having a culture that motivates and engages people is imperative. Also, the, we need to build an environment where every stakeholder regarding the product and what we deliver feels respected, has a clear role and responsibility, we need an environment that promotes ownership and obviously um, engage uh, all departments in the product journey. Uh, especially that engagement in the product delivery journey is particularly important for the engineering because, as I said before, in the pre PLG era, engineering was usually you know quite distant from the product vision and the mission. They were just you know the people that were delivering code. Uh, that now has to change. So if we were to set what I said before into pillars, we start from the foundation, which is your people, your culture, the way you want to build your firm. On top of that, you need to build your own unique framework that will guide you to your own unique PLC journey. PLC, it's a huge term and, you know, it's probably sometimes too generic. You need to understand where you fit into that spectrum of PLG practices and principles. Once you figure that out, then you need to build processes and principles that will allow you to deliver business as usual, but will also allow you to innovate. And then finally, and most importantly, you need to make sure that you communicate all these processes, the vision, the way you exist, uh, the whys and the hows, to all the foundation, to all the stakeholders that need to understand the layers below the, the foundational, foundational layers. Um, so some important things about the culture and the ways we operate and the ways we communicate, things we also try and we always reiterate in GWI is the empathy, uh, promoting uh, delegation, promoting ownership, inclusion, we need to let all stakeholders, product, design, customer success, sales, engineering, uh, to have uh, a say, to, to be uh, able to shape the decision-making process, which means we need to clarify roles and responsibilities. We need to remove the barriers of communication and we need to remove the friction so that we can ensure the internal buy-in in order to go the 
to go forward and you know everyone knows why we're doing what we're doing so um an important piece that we preach also in the plc hub is that you need the product committee and you need engineering to be part of this product committee. Uh, you need a committee that adapts to customer feedback, that builds the roadmap, sets the feature scope, and more importantly, knows the problems that it's trying to solve, knows the value that it wants to deliver to the clients. And as you can see, what we are thinking it should be um, comprised of is like customer success, design, user experience, product, obviously, and engineering. Um, so on top of that, you now have your PLT framework. Remember the pillar, we're in pillar, um, second pillar or from the bottom, where now you, you're going to choose your PLT journey and you, for us, for engineers, that's, that means that we should understand that we're not here only to deliver. We're here to participate in the planning. We need to give uh, feedback the same way we receive feedback from our customers, from the internal stakeholders, from the bugs that we have, from the features that we deliver. We need also to give feedback back into what do we see it's working. We need to take ownership of the measures. We need to understand uh, things like, you know, uh, um, funnels, how a feature or a user journey transforms and actually pays off. All these things now, engineering needs to understand. And that's how we, we decide to build a product-led framework, which means for the engineers to start understanding all these things, we need to have a common way of communication. So we need to use a ubiquitous language, which is something that is pretty common in engineering but it's not really applied in most of the firms. And to put it simply, what it means is like the, the domain experts, your business experts usually have a certain set of uh, terms, no uh, specific uh, domain areas. All these things now have to be written down. They need to be uh, used from product briefs to PRDs, product requirement documents, down to the actual code that uh, the most junior engineer is writing so that you can all communicate customers, developers, designers with a common set of terms and a common language, which we call ubiquitous language. And then comes the uh, customer where we need to be agile. That's where the agile pillar comes in, where we need to understand that, all right, we have decided on a roadmap, but that doesn't mean that it's written in stone. We're not working with waterfall anymore, hopefully. So you need to have a prioritized, but feedback from itself is not enough, right? I mean, usually the, the companies fail to agree on a prioritization framework. They get all this feedback and then they, they're drowned. They don't really know how to execute. And that for me, the main reason that these things fail is because we don't measure things. And as you know, we don't know what we don't measure. And does do we need to measure everything? No, nope. we need to measure the things that matter. But for every firm, that might be something different. The, the principle we need to keep here is that if we don't measure, we don't really know, means we cannot prioritize, means we cannot execute on the feedback we get. A uh, use case from Microsoft, they actually use feedback in every part of their uh, software delivery cycle. So they use feedback in code, which comes, you know, in the smaller, uh, in the small teams, in everyday delivery, in pull requests, code reviews. They take feedback from customers on the actual software they deliver on the products. They take also feedback internally and from customers on design, and they take collective feedback in order to save their priorities. And if Microsoft does it, I guess it makes sense for everyone. Uh, so as I said at the beginning, I'm uh, strongly against engineering versus product roadmap. Um, I really believe that it should be a common roadmap where product brings the ideas and engineering enables them. So the thing is that we, we need to have engaged engineers in order to explore and innovate. Then we need to define the problem because usually we just deliver features for the sake of delivering. 
but in the PLG firm, we're not here just to deliver feature, right? We're here to provide value and value comes when we solve actual customer problems. So once we define the solution, we refine it, we break it down into small steps, we break it down into smaller deliverables that we can um, ship to production in an agile fashion. Then we do ship to production and then we have a process in order to support these features, take feedback, you know, make them a bit better, what we call BAU, like business as usual. And that's a certain stream of operations that should be separated from the innovation stream of our operations. Um, now that we take, now that we have set these principles and we know how we're going to execute on a common roadmap with, you know, exploring, defining problems and everything, we need to know how we're going to, um, explore this thing, how are we gonna define the actual solution to the predefined problem? And for these things, you know, we need to iterate fast, which means we need engineering teams to be strong with building uh, minimum viable products or proof of concepts. We need these um, efforts to be led by the product committee. And we need always to measure the feasibility and actually have some metrics around the profitability of these features that we're going to deliver. So how how we build a minimum uh, viable product is like, you know, and what it is actually uh, is an app that validates a certain value proposition, a certain solution to a problem that might be many. We test this hypothesis. We provide a really tiny set of a user experience and we do care of the quality of the code which is something usually engineers don't take uh, seriously or actually sometimes they take it too seriously we don't really need to know if uh, we've built that solution ready to scale that's something that you should look afterwards we don't really care here about the performance or security measures or um, other, obviously you always care about GDPR, but you know you don't care about having the most secure code or tackling any scenario. And you don't care about the correct software licensing that you're using if you need to pay something later on that can be done. You just need to make sure that that value proposition is the one that really uh, hits the client and hits them correctly. And then we have the proof of concepts, which is something different. You, probably um, these concepts get uh, messed up or confused most of the time. So um, proof of concept is like, we need to verify just technical assumptions. These are driven mainly by the engineering department. You, while the MVPs are driven by the product, you just cover a small, tiny part. It might be like evaluation of a machine learning model or a deep learning model, just for a tiny spec of a bigger solution that might evolve into an MVP. And you test internally and you, you, you do that feedback loop internally, you need uh, customers to see POCs. So really it should be something hacky to validate the proposition. You don't need good quality of code. You don't need designs. You don't need customer feedback. It's just like the smallest, tiny uh, technical bit that you can verify. Is it working? Is it not? Trust me, these things should fail fast. If your engineering department takes like two months to build a POC, something is going wrong. It's not a POC. Uh, so let me reiterate re uh, the differences. MVP is about transparency and alignment. Product is aware that there should be aware that there is a technical debt that should be paid afterwards and is product is the leader of this effort. Uh, the, the reason we build this is to mitigate the risk. We need to build these things with respect to the clients, but we need to be transparent that it's not a full experience yet. Uh, and we need to have some initial KPIs benchmark, benchmarks in order to be able to evolve this thing into an actual proposition problem solution. While with POCs, effort is led by the engineering. Uh, that just, you know, goes in there with wide ideas and the build them and the priority in um, the series of the POCs you have to build is also, again, uh, coming from the engineering in terms that the engineering will give you an estimate of the effort and then, you know, you can product 
uh, design, customer success can decide which POCs should be built first. So these are two useful tools which you need data in order to know where you're going next. And this is how you can validate and prioritize. They can help you with a prioritization framework. And you're going to probably hear me a lot of time to talk about a common currency that uh, I think needs to exist between engineering and all the other stakeholders in a PLG firm. Usually engineers used to work with what we call um, story points. So story points are a very good measure to measure complexity or to track the velocity of a team. But it should be just that used internally within your squads, your teams, however you want to call them, it shouldn't get outside of the engineering department. In a PLG engineering team, though, we stop using that. We might use it internally, but we start talking about time. So it's important to have that common currency, which for me, there's no other than uh, time. So we don't need to measure complexity anymore. We need to measure solutions. We need to measure the value that we're going to deliver in specific time frames with specific milestones in place. Uh, so that's why for me, especially in a product-led SaaS environment, story points tell me nothing. And here's a set of metrics around that common currency, which I encourage you all of you to uh, sit down with your engineering managers, uh, engineering directors, vice president, whatever the role, and create the dashboards that you can actually track these things because these will tell you how accurate you can execute on your uh, roadmap and how fast or slow the velocity of your engineering team uh, is and what changes need to be done if there are some pain points bus factors and stuff like that first and foremost cycle time from the time that we have an idea how much how much does it take in order to ship it into production first commit to deployment deployment frequency and i have a separate session later on in the talk about continuous delivery uh can you deploy every day do your uh, engineer does your engineering department have the processes in place in order to feel safe that we can deploy in hours or we can deploy every morning or every other day whatever you decide change failure rate how often are these deployments fail do they fail significantly uh do we do they produce outages these stuff you should also know about them and then in case that something like that is happening what's our mean time to recovery what's our business continuity uh you know what's our slas and all these so continuous delivery, continuous integration, engineering department, product. We plan, then engineering codes, then we all together test in staging environment. We deploy to production, and then we go again into that loop. It's easier said than done. You need to talk with your engineering department. They need to understand why this thing is important. They need to understand the problems and we solve the value we deliver. So they need some uh, time and probably sometimes even delay further features or delay the roadmap in order to set these processes. They're, they're really critical and they need to be there because if you're not sure what you deploy doesn't break existing functionality or even doesn't break the product, if you don't have your testing procedures, if you don't know what's going to be delivered into production in terms of code, then you're in a set, you're you're set on a path of failure, and that's really important. So, if we take it a step further and we talk that okay, yes, PLG embrace agile, but we can do better than that. It means that when the product plans based on the roadmap, even if it's not a waterfall roadmap, we don't need to just plan anymore. We need to use customer feedback, client service, hard data. When the engineering goes through that CI, CD cycle that just codes, tests, and deploys, it continues to do that, but has also all these observability measures, which I don't talk here about, but it, it is part of my master classes and you can we can discuss it more there. So it it needs to build the instrumentation that will lead to monitoring and to the holy grail observability and then in an agile firm we say okay we delivered to our customers now they just what do they need to do just operate or execute uh and 
it's not that we need to provide value customers need to feel that they just got something they didn't think about it uh, something they didn't know they wanted but it's there and it makes their trip more robust it doesn't need it doesn't need from them uh, an expert knowledge but it's just you know a self onboarded product and which is something that you know if, if you're not shifting your mind into a um, plt mentality you're not getting there and you'll notice that i skipped a part which is uh, testing because i want to focus on that usually you know en engineer needs to test and it, testing is a and quality assurance is a big part we're not going to cover it today and it needs to be a part of the ci cd um, mentality and framework that you choose to use but we need more people to test we need more people to check what's going on. So we need our designers, we need our customer success, we need the product to go to that staging environment and see what's going on in there. Because maybe the code is working, but we have something wrong with the data. So we need to bring our data guys in. Or maybe there's something wrong with the design that it seems it doesn't work anymore. And you know, we realize now that it's gonna seep into production, we realize that probably, you know, we need to change it. So engineering might deliver the perfect back for your product and still you it won't land so testing needs to be a common sense a common responsibility and some numbers for the people that love them uh, you know there are tons of research out there um, i won't say anything new here probably but it is important to know that there is a hundred forty percent increase when you have something into development by having ci cd you can deliver uh, seriously faster you can reduce the time you spend into operation back in you know back fixing and all the stuff and you can increase fivefold the time you innovation and the polar framework like uh dual track agile but you know we uh, we can talk about that in another call but literally liberates the department into feeling more engaged more motivating going to work and you know it's going to be a fun day, uh, not another day. That I'm, but, uh, and obviously, we don't need to say a lot about the value of CSD. There are tons of people there, uh, tons of firms, tools, stocks. Everyone is engaged. You know, you've seen probably how Facebook is building, shipping every day, different learning models, Amazon uh, doing the same, PM stuff, other people doing. If they, don't, they don't solve it in the same way. We can go into every one of them. Uh, we don't have the time, unfortunately, but they, they solve it. They know what works for them. Uh, closing uh, slowly. Uh, you know, if we are to tie everything together, we need to reassure the alignment between every stakeholder. We need to form that product committee that has in mind the agile operations the vision and the product-led journey that we want our firm to take and it's this committee that's responsible of creating the unified roadmap uh, we need to deliver on the user experience that we have decided we need to engage our design department and have them together we can go into more details into that which we didn't discuss today like how you can build your own unique design system how you can have frameworks like job to be done in order to provide value of aim, the problems and how you shift internally also how you talk about features so you stop talking about um, deliverable and new features you start talking about okay our user have x y problems and these are that we propose and you start you know operating and obviously delivering when you deliver you need to start measuring behavior you need to measure data you need to know how the users are buying into the journey that you've built do they self on board do they use the you know the the features you deliver the way they were used to be used or the the way you envisage they're going to use them you need to track all of these things and the various tools and frameworks again we talk about all these in the in the master courses where you know you can even have uh 
videos of your sessions, or you can have uh, real-time data, or you can have aggregate data, you can create funnels, you can create dashboards, all these things. Let engineers be part of that because that's how you drive engagement, right? That's how you you can motivate your engineers. You can pass down the knowledge of why we built uh, what we're building. And a tip here that I can give is like, please do invite engineers into customer demos, into client demos. It's It provides tons of knowledge. It's so important. Many people have the need, but they never get the chance. It's something uh, that I see many firms lacking and it's so revelating for the engineers and it makes them so much more engaged. They, they, they really understand ton more of you know the actual things that they uh, ship to production. And the last thing we talked today, and I think uh, is really critical is your continuous delivery, your QA process, your quality checks, how all the product committees should participate, why is that important, why it's critical, and how it differs from old style firms to agile firms and how it evolves to uh, PLG. Uh, and I think that's the gist of it for today. Uh, I don't think uh, we're gonna get into anything uh, deeper unless we have uh, questions. Despina, I don't know Hi. if you're here. Yeah. Hello, hello. So we have one question uh, before we wrap it up. I, what are some best practices for splitting engineering resources between roadmap development and growth development? And growth development. I guess, okay, I guess that means I'll rephrase it. I don't know, I'm not sure if we're talking about the same thing here, probably about a roadmap developer business development business as usual, like, you know, the features that we know we need and growth innovation. Uh, I've seen many practices. I won't talk about best practices because it really depends. I need you to come a bit closer to the microphone. We barely can hear you. Okay. Is it better now? I don't, I have my airport, so I don't do anything can you hear me yeah now it's better all right perfect cool uh so in terms of that split yes there is uh there are some rules that you can see in silicon valley firms where you know they take fridays off or they take like 20 percent of your time off or 10 percent of your time off and you can build stuff or you can work on a secret roadmap like the growth roadmap i thing that works if you have really mature engineers so if and also if you if you're past the um, the level where you're still paying your technical debt because in every journey you'll start delivering you'll start building things things are going well then they go slowly because you didn't pay your debt now you have to pay your debt you don't really have the time to to grow, you know, to innovate when you're into that phase. So we need firms that are past that phase and we need engineering teams that are mature. Uh, it can happen, I've seen it working, but I've seen it also fail miserably. Another thing you could do is just use dual track agile. So you have some teams and when, by what I mean teams, I mean cross-functional teams. So you have a set of product managers you have a set of engineers, you have a set of designers. They start to, you know, they start to talking about all these crazy ideas, all these innovations. You bring in data science, you bring in machine learning, you start building these features. These features start taking shape in the form of an MVP. You've done your POCs, now you're ready for an MVP. You have the other teams that are working with a proper track, the business as usual track, they're delivering features, you know, they're they're fixing bugs or they're delivering upgrades on the existing features and then when something is ready to be tested that came out from that innovation track then it's time to merge again pros, pros and cons from really down to you know practical issues like what was the latest version of the code they used in order to build that innovation how much has it changed until they actually deliver from do you have the operations and the frameworks to do a b testing can you deliver it on the side and you know not breaking the existing functionality do you have your ci cd in there in order to deliver these things 
And then when you dismantle that team that built the innovation feature, who has the ownership anymore? So who is the owner of this feature? Um, interesting problems to solve. We actually do talk about these things in the other um, master classes. I don't, but I, what I want to say is there's no silver bullet. There's no best practice. I mean, the, the, these two obviously is the most common, what you'll find out there, either dual track agile or split percent of your capacity. That's why, again, it's important to talk about time and not story points. You cannot split story points. Uh, but yeah, interesting question. It's, you know, th these are the main uh, things that exist out there. That there have been uh, other, uh, in the past, there have been other research and other uh, methodologies, but I see them now uh, failing and, you know, going obsolete. Okay, and we thank you so much. <laughs> this was no more than enjoyable. We will wrap it up at here at this point. For Perfect. everyone who is interested, the session is going to be available on demand as well. Thank Great. you so much, George. And thank we, you very much, Desmina. We wait you to tune in for the next session with the Chief Product Officer from Miro to discuss what else the state of product led growth. Stay tuned. Perfect.
Hello, everyone. Welcome back to PLG Disrupt. We have a very, very special guest with us today, Varun Parmar, Head of Product at Miro. Varun, welcome. Uh, it's more than a pleasure to have you. Varun and I will discuss what else the state of product led growth. Varun was formerly, formerly in Box, so he's, this is not his first run on a product led growth organization. We will share all the insights and the best practices. We can share in something like under 30 minutes. And we hope we will take your takeaways and questions so that we can elaborate even more. Varun, uh, I think it's time for us to welcome you officially and for you to tell us a bit things about yourself because I think that all our audience wait for you to hear more. Yeah, no, thank you, uh, Despina. It's, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here uh, uh, as part of uh, PLG Disrupt. Uh, really excited to uh, have this uh, session with you. Uh, uh, you know, like you mentioned, uh, I am the chief product officer uh, here at uh, Miro. Uh, relatively new uh, to the company, about four months in, uh, but uh, uh, having a blast, uh, you know, uh, learning a lot in terms of uh, what our customers are using the product for all the amazing things that we are building from a, on a, on a roadmap perspective. And, uh, you know, just a little bit background about myself. Uh, I've been in the collaboration space for uh, close to uh, uh, 22 years. Uh, started off in Adobe, spent about seven, seven and a half years, multiple roles, but I was then uh, finally in the document cloud business. Um, then worked for a couple of startups. I was the, uh, you know, started an, a, a company on my own and that company uh, was acquired by Box. Uh, I was also the chief uh, uh, product officer for the uh, cloud content management division at EMC. And then prior to uh, Miro, I was the chief product officer at Box as well, which is a cloud content management company. So overall, uh, I like to say that there is a good uh, thing about my uh, work and then there's a bad thing. The good thing is that I understand collaboration software really well because I've worked uh, for such a long time. The bad thing is that's the only thing I know. <laughs> there's nothing else that I've <laughs> So, well, I would uh, actually not say that this is a bad thing. Collaboration <laughs> is not so, you know, standard in yeah. teams or beyond teams. I mean, alignment, I think it's perhaps the most important thing internally in order to achieve PLG or growth in general. So yeah. I would say that this is a valuable experience we, we need to, you know, to capitalize on during this session. And with that, I would like to start. Um, my first question for you is that you have a tremendous experience in the product domain. And as I said already, in product-led organizations. Prior to joining Miro, you were leading Box product strategy. Although your learning cannot be you know, contained in 30 minutes or, or more, uh, we would like to learn for you from you your thoughts on First, how much you think the SaaS industry has accepted that the product domain is perhaps the one responsible for sustainable growth, no matter actually the growth stage the organization is in. I think, I think that product should be incorporated from the early beginning for me. But when you are a startup, you are not only product, you are engineering, you are growth, you are doing pretty much everything. However, at some point you need to scale, you need to have a product that makes sense. And this is only something that PMs can do at this point. So we would like your learnings on this one, and then I will proceed with the next questions. Yeah, no, uh, that's, a, that's a really a good question, Despina. And I would say, like, maybe taking a step back, uh, the role and the importance of a product manager uh, today compared to three years ago, compared to six years ago, compared to nine years ago has dramatically changed. And the big uh, reason that I see is that increasingly uh, uh, the world uh, at large is realizing that uh, it's innovation uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, you know, drives business. It's innovation that uh, changes societies. It's innovation uh, that moves us all forward. And, uh, and what organizations are doing is that they are trying to be a lot more innovative. Um, and a big part of innovation is, uh, is what are you doing uh, from a product perspective? Obviously, it could be innovation in terms of how you're interacting with customers, how you're selling to them, you know, how you're marketing to them. Uh, but at the core of what an organization does is deliver a, a product and a service. Uh, and the fundamental question that, uh, that companies are, are asking themselves is how can they accelerate this innovation? And that is exactly where the role of a product manager or a product leader uh, uh, you know, comes in. 
uh, and the importance of this role is is increasing, uh, you know, pretty dramatically. I would say, uh, you know, there is there is a bunch of things that is uh, is is causing that to happen. One is just the uh, the rate of innovation that's happening in terms of the new technologies and trends that are happening. It used to be, uh, you know, cloud and mobile was the thing that you were focused on, and then more recently. Uh, we started to have artificial intelligence and somebody has to think about, you know, how to take advantage of that trend. And then more recently, you're having things like, uh, you know, a blockchain that you have to incorporate. We are seeing things uh, from companies like Facebook or I should call Meta, uh, as well as uh, Microsoft announce all the things that they're doing around uh, virtual reality or augmented reality. Right. So there are all these massive technological shifts uh, or disruptions or, or, or new, new concepts that are coming up. And, and someone in an organization needs to think about them uh, from a perspective of how do you take advantage of those trends? You know, how do you build products and services that actually are built for this, this new technical uh, paradigm? And if you think about all the different roles, you know, there's, there's, there's an engineer role, uh, you know, they have a, a key thing to play and there's a designer role. They also have a key part of uh, what needs to be done. But somebody needs to think of this much more holistically. They need to think of it from a strategically. They need to think of uh, what product needs to be built, what the requirements are. You know, how do you basically start to uh, move uh, the organization in that direction? And, and, and that is the fundamental reason, in my perspective, why a product role uh, or a product leader has become uh, really important. And inside of that, I would say, sort of tying it to the, the theme of this conference is that uh, how do you then, once you define this service or this initiative or this, this capability, how do you then start to drive growth, which is a proxy for like, how do you, uh, you know, make sure users are seeing this capability, how they're adopting it and how they're getting value. How do you start to do that more from in, inside the product as opposed to outside through different channels and mechanisms? And I think that's also uh, driving a lot of uh, focus uh, uh, on, the, on the product persona. I think personally that the product persona has many roles, more than anticipated perhaps originally. Um, I think it will come to own more roles again in the future, perhaps the revenue role. We don't hear that often. We don't uh, make uh, the one one put together, but actually your product brings money. So at some point we will start to you know make the, uh, the engineering too, but product should actually be responsible for the ROI in the end, because it designs and manages the, the, the product and itself, the whole experience. And that brings me to my next question, which is, OK, we hear a lot about product experience. It's a new buzzword as much as product-led growth. I think they go at hand together. Um, how much do you see that? I wouldn't say product-led growth a trend, but I would say that it's a new reality. How much do you think it's being adopted by SMBs versus enterprise versus the industry overall? Because we are now in the fourth year that PLG is being heard. You do that very much internally at Miro. You constantly iterate your product-led strategy. Uh, it's a playground for my eyes. Uh, but uh, I think that not the whole industry is there yet. It's going there, but I would like your take as well. Yeah. So uh, if we uh, start maybe with the, the largest uh, corporations, uh, the enterprise segment that you mentioned, uh, Despina, I would say that uh, we are really in infancy. We are in such early stages of, uh, of products and companies that uh, go target the enterprise that are taking uh, PLG motions and, and successfully running them. Um, you know, I, I spend a lot of my time uh, with other uh, chief product officers at these uh, enterprise SaaS companies, and uh, I would say the vast majority of them, vast majority of them are still focused on the more traditional ways of building the business, uh, mm -hmm. where you have a significant investment uh, uh, happening uh, in, the, in the marketing and the sales function, uh, which tends to be more focused on building a Rolodex of contacts and then uh, using those contacts to basically push the product inside of that segment. Uh, so uh, so I think uh, we are really in the early stages and, and what we will start to see is that at some point, uh, companies are realizing that in order to grow really, really fast, in order to scale the business, there are much more, uh, much more effective uh, mechanisms of doing that even inside of the, uh, of the enterprise. So, uh, you know, if you think about the concept that Splunk, uh, uh, you know, pioneered several years ago where, you know, you could be a hyper technical persona, you know, and you want to do uh, monitoring 
of your application um, uh, that your company is delivering. You could just go to Splunk like for free, download uh, you know their product, and then start to deploy it on a server and start to monitor uh, what's happening. So I think like there are some early examples of what's uh, starting to happen, but it's uh, it's very different. I would say on the completely other end of the spectrum, Despina, there is uh, smaller companies, and those companies are uh, have one constraint, and that constraint is that. Uh, they don't have the resources that uh, some of the bigger companies uh, have had. And I think that has been like one of the best things uh, in terms of uh, the growth uh, of PLG is that these companies uh, start to uh, innovate uh, and think of ways uh, in which they can, um, uh, you know, uh, engage users right inside of the product and do it in ways that is beneficial for the user as well. It's much more personalized. Uh, it's it's a lo lot more relevant to what the user is trying to do in that particular context. Uh, and uh, and the insights that they gain uh, through these uh, experiments and through these uh, flows that they're building in the product is really allowing uh, these smaller companies to operate at a level that a lot of these uh, big companies uh, can't. So overall, I would say uh, this movement or, or, or has, has just started. Uh, you know, there are some uh, some early successes and companies that have actually done some really great work. Uh, you know, um, uh, at Miro, we, we are doing some interesting stuff mm -hmm. here. Uh, but then I would say uh, there are other companies, uh, you know, including Slack or in some cases Atlassian, uh, who've also done some really amazing work uh, in the early days uh, that we've learned from, uh, you know, at Miro uh, and trying to drive, uh, you know, greater value uh, uh, across uh, across the ecosystem. So what would be the advice from your end uh, on organizations that, you know, they're not, they were not from scratch product-led, uh, they're trying to become perhaps a product-led organization, or they grow and, you know, they need to actually put in place where the product is going, if the vision and the mission actually align, if the end user experience is the expected, if they can even manage the growth at the end of the day, if you ask me. Uh, not only for, you know, how to become product-led, but how should they put together a product team? Where should they start? We also hear a very new role that comes to the rise. Again, a new persona in the product domain, the pr uh, product ops. For us, product ops, for example, has just so many roles to do, so many alignment internally to, you know, uh, enable the product domain to rise within and align with the rest of the organization, deliver the best product possible. So if I was an organization scaling or growing or wanting to go there, where would I start? Yeah, so I would say uh, there are sort of two aspects to this. I, I would, uh, I would uh, maybe separate out like, uh, you know, a, a team that's focused on product-led growth uh, from a product operations team. I would say if, if you're in a company uh, that is uh, in growth stage and you want to focus more on PLG, uh, then uh, the way probably to do that is to uh, start off with a, a small team and it could be just a team of one person, uh, but, uh, but get someone who has the experience uh, 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 in, in product-led growth uh, that already has a toolkit uh, that they have uh, experimented with and seen results and bring that person in the organization and then uh, set them up for success. I think like oftentimes what happens is that companies have their own views in terms of what needs to be done and then they try to impose these views on, on people. In, in this case, what you need to do is completely opposite. You need to recognize that this is a, a strategic initiative. You need to make sure that you give it uh, more time uh, for, for this initiative to, uh, to establish itself, to start to grow and then to start to deliver results. So it is an investment that you're making and that investment will pay off in due course of time, but it's not gonna happen overnight. And depending on the product and, and how well-formed the experiments are, you know, it can, it can take uh, weeks or months or, or you know, for, for you to see some really uh, meaningful results. So I would say start small, experiment, make sure that you are in a learning mentality, uh, you are bringing someone in and you are empowering that, uh, that person or that team. Uh, to show results and then uh, have like very clear expectations in terms of sort of the velocity in which uh, uh, the organization is is, is moving. Uh, in general, PLG teams uh, move uh, extremely fast. Uh, they come up with with uh, uh, with uh, atomic experiments, uh, not molecular experiments. It's atomic, so it's much. I love the word. <laughs> I really love the word. <laughs> 
So come up with atomic experiments that you can quickly deploy. Uh, you know, it's very, very data driven. So one of the other requirements I would say, Despina, is that you need to make sure that there is some level of instrumentation on the data side. You need to make sure that there are the right set of tools and support available for this product teams to basically look at the data because like you cannot launch these things in blind. You have to make sure that these are well-defined experiments with hypothesis, with uh, success criteria. What, what, what is the North Star metric that you're trying to move? What, what is it that this, uh, this experiment is really trying to accomplish and make sure that then you're using data to see if it's working or not. And if it works, then you put more fuel on the fire. If it doesn't work, then you basically have to just choke the oxygen here and say, okay, you know, tried this, didn't really result, let's move on to the next one. But velocity in which you move is extremely important. And there's a concept uh, that we like to talk about, which is like, you have to make sure that you're the first to hit the brick wall. What do I mean by that? So, you know, velocity in many ways can be a competitive advantage for product teams and organizations. And, and in the beginning, you don't know what the right answer is. So you have two approaches. You can take uh, for a really long time to do all your research, all your analysis to come to the answer, or you can take another approach where you can have a well-defined uh, hypothesis that's based on some data. And then you move very quickly in terms of iterating in production. You build something and you launch it. And then you hit the brick wall. And the brick wall is you get to this, the answer, which is yes or no, faster than anyone else. And if you hit the brick wall faster, then you can turn around and move in a direction that you want to, but you will actually have that competitive advantage. So that's what I would say on the PLG side. On the, on the second part of your question, uh, Despina, in terms of product operations, uh, I would say... Uh, depending on the size of the organization, it may or may not make sense for you to invest in product operations. Generally, uh, when the organization, uh, you know, gets to multiple product teams, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, and 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 you're trying to now uh, make sure that there is some level of consistency that's been driven through all of these multiple product teams. Having a product operation function helps, you know. So. Uh, you know, maybe in the early days as a founder or as a product leader, you could sit sit in through all the reviews. You could actually have uh, the exact idea of who is working on what, and you could actually go in and course correct. You know, that you could do when the company is in a, in a certain size. But then when it grows, uh, you have to change your tactics. You have to think about processes, systems that actually will scale. And you have to be very clear what what, what are these systems meant to do. So is product ops a function? Uh, you know, that is 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 more for visibility or, or is it a function that is an enabler? It's an enabler that allows other product teams to move fast, to have a consistent experience. And so your customers should not see, oh, when I go to the admin console, the product looks very different than when I actually go to the end user side. And it's like, oh, there are two different things. That was my point, actually, that we don't see it like a functionality that, you know, aligns the product team only. Uh, we see it as the orchestrator of putting together the processes, in that case, for product-led growth. But besides PLG, uh, don't put a tag on it per se. We don't need to do that. Uh, we need someone to have, to align the product domain with you know, the rest of them. We, we need to put a process together that needs iteration. We need someone to monitor that. And obviously, you cannot do that only as a product domain, but as a product domain who needs the feedback from the customer-facing teams, you need processes that make sense for the customer facing teams too. You need feedback that makes sense for engineering, who is going to deliver that. And if you have 20 iterations and experimentations, engineering need to prioritize. So how do you do that? Because you, if you have a big, a very you know, popular product, a product, that, a, product, a product and organization that keeps growing, this becomes harder and harder. And then you build features nobody use in the end. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> And now I'm going to focus on Miro, obviously, because this is the point. Uh, we have seen tremendous iterations, experimentations from Miro uh, on the sign-up process, on the free products it offers. I think that both us internally and our audience would like to know some of the secrets behind that success. Uh, Miro has realized exponential, exponential hypergrowth the last few years. COVID obviously helped a lot all the SaaS organizations to go there, but the successful product needs, only a successful product needs that kind of growth, if you ask me. So uh, I guess we would love to learn more about it. Yeah, uh, so I think uh, uh, there's uh, there's a couple of uh, things here maybe uh, to highlight. I think like one is uh, is that, uh, uh, you know, we have uh, we have a team uh, that is uh, is focused on uh, uh, on growth. 
uh, that's focused on our uh, self-serve business. And uh, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty uh, big team uh, from an investment perspective. Uh, and so we take this uh, very seriously. So this is going back to my earlier point that, you know, you have to uh, basically put your, your money uh, where your uh, mouth is. And so if you believe this is a key priority, you have to invest in it. And, and in our case, um, we have a pretty significant team that's uh, that's focused on it. And it's run uh, by a leader who uh, has been with the business uh, for um, uh, for eight to nine years. Right. So she uh, she uh, was uh, amongst the early ones uh, to, uh, uh, you know, uh, when the company was founded and uh, understands uh, uh, the product, understands the use cases, understands the users, understands the uh, the sales of flows really, really well. And using that expertise has basically built um, uh, uh, a great organization that actually focuses on the entire uh, journey of the uh, the end user. So, uh, you know, teams uh, focused on the uh, you know the acquisition aspect of things. You know, so so how do we think about uh, getting users uh, you know into the the product funnel? Uh, you know, things uh, you know once you are basically uh, signed up as a user, you know, how do we make sure? Uh, that we are activating you and activating you uh, in the product, activating you for certain <laughs> use cases, uh, and uh, and there's a team focused on that. And inside of that team, like there are certain product capabilities that are extremely important that we look at. So, for example, uh, you know our templates feature. So when you use Miro, one of the 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 things that a lot of users talk about is uh, you know the the rich uh, library of templates that we have, uh, including some that the community has created. So it's called the Miroverse. And, uh, you know, it's a fantastic uh, capability that allows us uh, to uh, basically activate the users as part of the, the flow. And, and obviously, there is, there is retention and active use that, uh, that template. <coughs> so there's a team that's actually focused on that. And we think about those product capabilities from, from the user funnel perspective. Uh, you know, there's, there's a team that's, that's focused on the en engagement aspect of it. So when, uh, when users are activated and they are now using... Uh, the product how do we make sure that the frequency of usage uh, increases a big part of that is use cases certain use cases um, uh, you use uh, more often than others uh, you know part of that is uh, how are you br bringing uh, users back into the product so notifications uh, as a mechanism the activation. yeah really i would love to discuss this <laughs> something yeah. further than email though i mean <laughs> that's right that's right so we yeah, we've got very strong like notifications uh, in in the product uh, that we then have connected to your team communication apps like Slack uh, and to Microsoft Teams that basically instantly brings you back uh, into the product. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, you know uh, the the expansion aspect of it as well is like you know okay now you have a, a a user how do we make sure that the user brings their team teammates you have one team how do you make sure this this team brings the other adjacent teams that they work inside of the business so there are folks who who are focused on, on that as well okay uh i would like to narrow down this to a point of product data uh which is my favorite one and the le the less explored one if you ask me i don't really know that i don't really think that there are many people that can talk about product data uh, or product data experimentation or you know analysis or put them together with business KPIs, uh, the association is not there yet. But I would like your take on that from Miro and beyond. I mean, I guess that you put, uh, you, you are concerned with all the stages, activation, reactivation, retention, growth, expansion, but where do you actually make the difference? Um, how do you decide that this kind of data is, you know, I don't use them. I don't need them. At this point, uh, instrumentation there is not needed. I mean, there are so many data. We need to know what to neglect and what to take in. Uh, which is your favorite takes from the customer journey, from the touch points? I don't know. How do you align that with the rest of the customer-facing teams? What yeah. information do you pass in? Anything that would align with that? Yeah, yeah. So I would say, first of all, uh, as a company, uh, you need to uh, make sure that uh, you have a clear set of metrics that uh, your product teams are held accountable for. Uh, you know, in some places they call it North Star metric, uh, you know, uh, so like which, which is the one metric if you had to pick uh, for your business that uh, your, your product team should focus on moving it. And so, uh, you know, in our case, there, there is a, there is a, uh, there's a North Star metric that, uh, uh, you know, we did extensive analysis and we uh, looked at, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, user retention rates and growth rates. And we came up with a metric that uh, is uh, uh, is important uh, for the product teams to focus on. So that's one aspect of it. There's obviously 
uh, the active use aspect of it, you know, is it like daily active users, weekly active users, monthly active users, and so on and so forth. So once you have these high-level metrics uh, identified, then then people know at the end of the day, any user that we get through the the user, um, uh, you know, self-serve funnel needs to result into a set of behaviors in the product that needs to be driven for these North Star metrics and for the active use metrics. And then uh, inside of uh, each of the, the user acquisition funnels, you know, you have to uh, figure out what is it that uh, the metrics are that you're going to focus on that actually moves the user through the funnel in ways that they will actually drive, uh, you know, this particular metric. So what are the kind of user personas? What are the kind of use cases that you need to enable across through the funnel? that leads to these uh, these metrics so uh, so on on that side i think like uh, we uh, generally have uh, each of these uh, teams uh, you know there are specific metrics that they are trying to drive and uh, and for those metrics uh, you know they have targets that they set up for each and every experiment uh, you know that they are uh, running so like let's say there is like a team that's actually uh, you know focused on conversions or activations and so there's a very specific metric. And, you know, with, in our case, like we've got years and years of benchmark data that we are focused on. And, you know, a lot of this is just experimentation. You keep experimenting and you figure out like what are the two or three metrics that really move the needle. And then you just like focus on, on those metrics. You lock on those. And then you keep adding more and more experiments, more and more things that are actually going to move uh, uh, those metrics. So in the beginning, you're trying to experiment both with these metrics and these experiments, but then you quickly move into a model where uh, where you lock into these metrics and then it's the experiments that uh, you're trying to drive forward. Okay. Um, what about if we could narrow down three experiments or strategies or takeaways from Miro or from Box or from your experience so far that you have seen worked a lot um, in the go-to-market strategy, for example? I, I've seen more than 50 different experiences for Miro so far. I cannot keep track on it. They keep launching new and new stuff. And, you know, it's awesome because it's breathtaking for us. But if we could narrow down three best practices that perhaps besides iteration, which is a bit abstract, something that, you know, makes the user click, something that you see that perhaps needs further investigation. How do you judge that? Anything that would give some of, the, of your secret sauce? Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll yeah keep it uh, a little bit uh, high level and, and stuff. But like the, if, if there were uh, three things that I would uh, highlight, uh, I would say uh, one is uh, have a deep focus on the kind of uh, user personas and use cases that you are trying to drive and have flows that are optimized for those uh, uh, user personas and those use cases. Uh, so if somebody is entering Miro and their primary use case is work then optimize the entire workflow for workshops. If a user is entering uh, the product and their primary use case is mapping and diagramming, then optimize the entire uh, uh, flow, user flow, uh, for that uh, particular uh, use case. And so I think like that, that's one which is like you're trying to meet uh, the user uh, right where uh, they want to be in terms of what they think that the product is going to deliver them value. And having uh, you know streamlined flows for them uh, is going to be important. So that's one. I think the the second is uh, it's extremely important uh, for you to deliver value uh, to the user. And so we've got some internal metrics in terms of like uh, we, we've looked at like you know x number of days if people take y number of actions, then they're going to be a sticky user with uh, for us. And so without getting into the exact data. But you need to figure out like what that behavior is at what point, uh, you know, what actions the user needs to take in the first three, five, seven days, whatever your your models tell you, where the user, you know, with a high degree of confidence is going to convert uh, into uh, uh, into a, a returning user, into a, an active user. And so for that, uh, uh, you need to make sure that you are highlighting uh, the parts of the product that uh, is closely correlated with those actions that the user is going to take. So a specific thing here is, is onboarding of the users is extremely important. So what are the actions you need to expose uh, on the first day, the third day, the fifth day, the seventh day that they need to take? And if they take that, then they are going to actually convert into an active user. So a lot of focus on experimentation for onboarding and different types of onboarding. Like it used to be tooltips. Now it's video. In some cases it's more interactive. 
so we we are constantly uh, uh, you know experimenting with that i think you're smiling maybe you have a a, a comment or point to make on that <laughs> yeah, yeah well you hit the nerve because onboarding is my favorite word you know in the world ever more than plz even um yeah. I think that onboarding is perhaps, you know, the sales agent for the, from the product itself. Obviously, if the product is not good, the onboarding is not going to save everything or anything. I mean, I would be surprised if an onboarding could revamp the whole experience, but it needs to be for sure contextual. It needs to align with product data. It needs to be, you know, combine tech touch with high touch because at some point you need to actually present the opportunity for the user to connect with the customer success team, with the sales team, with the support team. Um, you need to present everything in the product on the right time because we all know how busy users are and how bored they are from just tooltips. So yeah, uh, it's a session that we could go on for two days and I wouldn't stop. So, but you don't have two days for us. <laughs> you only have uh, 30 minutes and we would need to wrap this up because we are ready for the next session. Uh, I would like to, uh, to actually thank you so much for joining us, even for that little to the next session. Absolutely. This was so much fun. Thank you. I uh, really enjoyed thank all you. the questions and the interaction. Awesome. Good luck with the session. Awesome. Thank you so thank much. You. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. And uh, with that, with the session of Byron coming to an end, we are ready to welcome our next session in just under five minutes from now, which is going to be a journey uh, and panel that is going to analyze the differences in the startup journey in times of change. Stay tuned. We are coming back in five minutes or so. Thank you so much.
Hello and good evening, everyone. Here we go. Hi. There's all the faces. Hello, hello. 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 Good hello. to see you all. Okay. Likewise. I am going to start off um, with welcoming everybody to the last panel of day one for the PLG Dis uh, Disrupt Summit. Um, Starting off with a traditional uh, welcome, San Bonani from South Africa. That's how we traditionally say say hello here. And that's exactly where I'm dialing in from, Cape Town, South Africa, our startup capital of the country. Um, to introduce you to everyone, or to introduce everyone to me, my name is Victoria Harris. To be fair, everyone calls me Vo. I'm only Victoria Harris if I'm in trouble. So if I say something wrong, call me Victoria, and I immediately know to backtrack and say sorry. Um, so call me Vo, please. Um, and a little bit about me so that all of our viewers know who this, this wild and opinionated human is. I am traditionally a founder, um, what everyone dubs as a serial entrepreneur, but I really dislike that, that, um, that saying. Um, it just uh, it makes me see that I take way too many risks and I fail fast. But coming out of a founder background, I have now crossed sides and I am a startup mentor, go-to-market strategist, um, and facilitator across multiple markets in Africa. So I support uh, early stage entrepreneurs being um, uh, as adventurous as I was in my early career and taking that big jump. Before we get into introducing all of the judges, um, I just want to start off with some housekeeping. So, um, uh, just a few rules. Panelists, this is a, a fireside chat more than a formal um, panel. I, I'm not a fan of a formal panel. You'll learn this very quickly about me. I like a chat. So let's give everyone a meaty conversation. Um, feel free to disagree. None of us learn when we all, all sing from the same song sheet. So I like to hear different opinions. Um, and most importantly, to not um, interrupt, so don't talk over your co-panelists. But that being said, between this dashboard and my questions and another screen, I might very well miss a hands up, a flag, or in, in I mean, hosting real pa or in, in person panels, you get the lean of the couch and you know someone has something to say. So I might miss the lean. If that's the case, please just jump in um, and, and let us know your opinions. Questions aren't just for one person. It's for all of us to have a chat about. All right, so today's panel is on the startup journey in times of change. And wow, has it been all sorts of times of change in, in all of our markets. So before we jump into discussing that, let's get everyone to introduce ourselves going around the virtual room. So introduce yourself. What is your traditional greeting from where you're from, what are the markets you operate, and a little bit about yourself and your bio, please. Um, Amodini, and also, if I pronounce your name incorrectly, please correct me. Nobody likes the names being said wrong. Um, so, Amodini, am I saying it correctly, first of all? And let's start with you, please. Yeah, sure. Well, you can call me Amo. That's just easier. Okay. Uh, it's Amodini. Um, originally, I'm from India, so I'll, I'll, the greeting is, is Namaste. Uh, but I'm actually based out of Toronto, so it's just a hello <laughs> here, just like everywhere else. Um, so nothing specific. I can quickly talk a little bit about myself and my, my background. Um, I am an investor at Compass Digital Ventures, uh, which is the corporate venture capital arm for Compass Group. And for those of you who do not know um, Compass Group, we're actually one of the largest food service organizations. Um, the parent company is based out of UK. Um, over a $30 billion organization in North America is the largest chunk of our business. Um, we work in three main sectors. So we do food service across higher education, healthcare, hospitals, as well as offices. So our clients include Google, Microsoft, Amazon, et cetera. And so Composition Ventures was launched uh, early this year, which with our first fund um, to invest, start investing in startups. And my background, personally, I come from a management consulting background from BCG uh, Digital Ventures, where I helped uh, build startups for Fortune 500 companies and help them incubate and get funding to scale out um, and run independently. That's a little bit about myself. Really excited to be here and, and 
talk about the challenges of startups in the, in the time of adversity. Thank you for that. Um, I'm super interested to pick your brain on both coming from emerging markets and our formal markets. So that's really exciting. Thank you. Um, uh, Tanos, over the pond, focusing on European markets, from what I'm told. Great. Nice, nice to see you all here. I'm Thanos. I'm the uh, organizer of European Startup Universe. I'm born and raised in Greece. Uh, I have uh, seen the inequalities and we have seen the inequalities between these ecosystems. So it, imagine that how, you, how easy uh, for someone, how easy it is to, for someone that started its, uh, program, its uh, uh, project in uh, Greece or in uh, uh, Central Eastern Europe. So you can understand what are the problems and the inequalities. There's no access to funding. There's no access to network. So um, through that, uh, having an having experience on uh, uh, engineering, my background is engineering and business, uh, running organizations in order to develop the local ecosystem. We we are scaling it up right now with European Startup Universe. So European Startup Universe is a program to democratize access uh, to funding and network for early early stage startups in uh, in Europe. So currently, we I'm here to discuss and share with you some. Uh, insights about the European startups, especially from the uh, early stage um, uh, level. So excited to be here and to discuss with all of you. Um, so yes. Awesome. Thank you. And your your traditional greeting from Greece. Kalispera. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Virginia, uh, Virginia, over to Holland, where if my bad Dutch corrects me, it's Goeiedag. Yes, uh, that's correct. But uh, I will say ciao a tutti because I, I'm Italian and currently okay, based good. in the Netherlands. But uh, yes, you had a very good pronunciation, uh, probably because of the relationship with mm -hmm. the Netherlands, right? So yes. um, I'm Virginia Medili, and by the way, you pronounced my name uh, perfectly, and I'm Thank quite you. happy about that because everyone uh, makes a mistake. And unfortunately, I don't have a short form for it. That's too bad. Uh, but as I was saying, I am from Italy. I live in the Netherlands and I work as a venture manager at Slimmer AI. That is a venture studio, a Dutch venture studio in Amsterdam, uh, where basically we invest and we build uh, AI startups. So startups that leverage applied artificial intelligence. And we focus especially on, uh, on the B2B SaaS space. Uh, mainly in early stage, meaning from pre-seed to Series A, uh, and across Europe and across any industry. Just a few words about me. Um, I'm an engineer by training. Uh, before joining Slimmer AI, I focused on building tech products like software and hardware as a researcher. And then I pivoted in my career and I worked as a strategy consultant at uh, Boston Consulting Group. Super happy to be here and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. So we have two engineers on our panel tonight so far. <clears throat> I find it quite interesting. Engineers become entrepreneurs, I have realized, because you go to university to solve problems, you then graduate and get stuck in the same job doing the same problem day on, day out, and go, where can I solve more problems? And you land up going into entrepreneurship. I've seen the trend. Okay. That's right. <clears throat> Terry, um, dialing in from the UK. Yes, absolutely. So hi, guys. My name is Terry. I live in London, the UK, and I'm an engagement lead and venture associate at Mahara, which is a specialist pre-seed to Series A venture delivery partner and sweat investor. So we operate primarily in the UK and US markets, but um, uh, to the point of having a touch in emerging markets, we have locations around the world, as well as London, UK and Austin, US. We also have Cape Town, South Africa. We've got a very major presence and Bangkok and Thailand. So our role is to help the businesses that we partner with to reach Series A and beyond with my personal part in particular being focusing on startups with an application in using machine learning and AI so coming from a machine learning engineer background before while also working as a management consultant. So I don't know if that evens the scores between engineering and consulting. It's like nearly I think there. it's even balanced now. Okay, thank you for that, Terry. All right, um, let's jump into questions. And please, um, the first one uh, uh, I am directing to you, but please for everyone, jump in when, you see, when there is something that you can contribute to. I really appreciate everyone yeah. just jumping in and having a chat. But let's start with this, this 
big hairy elephant in the room. And I have seen devastating impacts from COVID-19 um, with our startup ecosystem in South Africa and across Africa. Um, are you seeing similar? What is that impact in informal markets um, and within the markets that you are operating? And, and let's kind of unpack that a little bit and trends that are coming out of it. For sure, yeah. And um, I would say, I mean, that COVID was definitely devastating, but mm -hmm. I actually think the market uh, for startups, this was a good opportunity and, and an um, opportunistic time for a lot of startups. So we mm -hmm. can see the market saying something else as a whole where, you know, this year alone, we there's $158 billion in like venture capital money that has been spent. And this is the highest ever that's been invested in venture capital. Um, so the market is saying something else this is a good opportunity. I can speak for, uh, from a corporate perspective and what we are seeing, you know, how the, the user mindset or the mindsets are changing now with post COVID, especially from, um, a food perspective, a food service mm -hmm. perspective, our business was definitely hit really hard. I mean, mm. offices are closed, so we cannot serve any more customers at offices. Schools were closed. Um, hospitals, I mean, healthcare was running, but obviously that's um, that's a smaller segment, you know, comparatively uh, of the business. And so what we're mm. seeing is now like significant growth or trends in omni-channel commerce in which we're seeing as an overall trend too, but for ourselves, like for food retail specifically, omni-channel is, is something that, has trans significantly changed our uh, business's mindset in the in the time of COVID. It's the only way for us to get more customers and drive more engagement. On-demand mm -hmm. economy is picking mm -hmm. up a lot. I mean, we see a lot of, of uh, investment flowing in delivery in dark grocery store uh, grocery um, startups now. Um, I still think right now there's some questions around the profitability of those models. Uh, but at the same time, we know that there is definitely demand on the consumer side from a convenience mm. standpoint. Um, mm. There's a lot happening that we've seen on the frictionless retail side. I mean, we see companies that are, you know, for self-checkout or cashless retail. And we ourselves are working in that area as well because now customers are more, it's not just about convenience, but I think what we're seeing is it's a combination of what I like to call the convenience and the experience economy. So it's, it's not just about the convenience, but like, how do I get an amazing experience while I have convenience? Um, mm. That's what customers seem to be looking for. And especially after COVID, uh, that's a mm. trend that we see has been heightened. And then lastly, I would just end by saying, you know, we see a lot of labor challenges and um, especially mm. post COVID, people have had <clears throat> to time to reflect and and think about what areas and what jobs we want to do. And so retail, food are seeing labor challenges. Um, and so that that increases the need for automation. And when I say automation, it's not just robotics, but any sort of automation in terms of processes, how we can make the, again, at the end of the day, how can we make a, a deliver a great experience for both the staff and the end customer at the end of the day? Thank you. And and I actually want to pick up on something you've said, being, you know, this year or we have seen the largest to date or recorded investment, VC investment into the startup ecosystem. Yeah. Where are we seeing that? And Terry, please jump in here as well, focusing on, on Series A yourself. Are we seeing that in later, safer investments, later stages, Series B and C? Or are we seeing that actually in the, the new innovative um, uh startups that are just launching at market. So where are we seeing those growth points? I think we're seeing a lot of investment in the series A and B space. So there's definitely, I mean, I wouldn't say it's primarily seed, but there is a lot of, of growth that we're seeing in like series A to B stage mm -hmm. when we start getting to product market fit and then mm -hmm. grow from there to growth stage. Uh, I mean, we all know the market right now is, I mean, there's a lot of capital flowing in the market right now. Mm. And so, you know, it's, it's being called the the alphabet soup right now. So um, we don't know what stage kind of fits what valuation exactly at this point. Um, but from what, what we're seeing right now, I mean, obviously the valuations are inflated um, and 
I, I don't know. I can't mm-hmm. speak to when that's going to come back to normal or if it will. But I, I do believe that there will be an equilibrium at some point that, that will hit. Um, but I, I think the, you know, the most amount of money is flowing in the series A and B stage right now because there is certain confidence in terms of product market fit at that point. Mm-hmm. And so then it's more about growing and getting mm-hmm. more market share at that stage. Okay, thank you. Terry, your opinion on that? I know you're sitting within Series A investments. Yeah, so I'd say, apologies for the noise in the background, I'd say it's a mixture of both, so Series A, Series B, and then further on down the line. Um, I, I can see there's a lot more appetite in the market for risk, so an increase in the volume yeah. of, of angel investments and, and everything. Is, I think investors are looking less towards more traditional roots of investment that may be divesting away from more traditional companies who may not have been able to address the challenges of not just this disruptive activity, but previous ones as well. So dating back to the Great Recession, seeing a big movement in, in change since then. Um, it seems that there's a lot of capital flowing from other markets. So we're talking kind of private equity markets, other areas of capital markets, corporate finance really flowing very excitedly into venture capital and especially with an eye on getting the next big thing. So where's this next Facebook going to come from? And and it's very, and, and the um, push towards crowdfunding as well. There have been, I think, I think a re- recent push was um, free trade a few days ago. They, they hit their limits within the first day or something. And there, there, there's many cases that are happening now where a lot of crowds investing platforms are seeing a huge swell in demand and a lot of people both retail and institutional investors piling in and wanting to get in into the into land of opportunity almost okay thank you um Thanos, i'm going yeah over to you i saw yeah, yeah. a finger yes uh, it's okay i could add something on the previous uh amodini and uh, terry uh, we today we've seen an acquisition of 100 million in a crowdfunding platform. So seeds are acquired by Republic. So there is a, a hype on that uh, uh, thing too. And uh, of course, um, we have seen lots of uh, major acquisitions too. So too many um, late stage startups acquired early stage startups. That's mm. two points that I could uh, add to the previous one to the previous. Uh, speakers that's an interesting comment why are we seeing that trend of later stage absorbing earlier stage <laughs> uh there is a why so they they would like to acquire maybe people or uh, technology and it's quite important for that uh, for that period to do things quicker and quicker so uh, the the early stage startups that has approved a model that works it's maybe a very good opportunity for uh, later stage startups. So, so startups that are um, getting uh, ready to to get some more stages uh, mm-hmm. needs more more technologies to to show on their pro- portfolios. So it's quite important for them and for their investors uh, to to present something new and new in order to get more more value. So it's quite important. And uh, having seen the my 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 perspective from the early stage and from founders on the uh, really early stage startups. Uh, as you know, the COVID situation uh, made us to be more time at home. So we have more time yeah. to work on side projects. So we have seen too many people, either engineers, mm-hmm. either consultants, to, to join on a side project, to discuss more with friends, so to develop projects. So we have seen uh, some uh, a booming. So the early stage um, uh, startup ecosystem right now is booming. Uh, we have seen also that there is uh, dry power there, as as Amodin and Terry said. So mm-hmm. too many angel investors are on the market with uh, dry powder, and they want to uh, to pour uh, that money to startups. And of course, many uh, traditional players or old-fashioned uh, players uh, like family offices have seen opportunities mm-hmm. on technology. So we've mm-hmm. seen that they they invest in technology too, and in, in early stage startups too. Okay, thank you. And it's quite interesting. We, we're seeing a lot of, in South Africa, a lot of products that are, are focused on talent acquisition, retain, retention, and training, which is quite interesting where you're saying you're seeing them just absorbing earlier talent pools. Um, so I quite like that take. Um, okay, Virginia, um, 
uh, hopping over to you, you know, as a venture manager, um, you have a lot of insight on the ecosystem, what we're doing, what we're doing that we could do better and how we can st uh, support our startups at market better as we are growing and you're, we're seeing these acquisitions on a variety of levels. So what can we actually as an ecosystem start doing better? Oh, you're on mute, I think. Yes, I was. Uh, so this is a very good question. I mean, I'm trying to give you an answer from the B2B perspective, right? That is the one that I see daily. So um, is the is the focus we have at Slimmer. So let me tell you that. So the product market fit journey is something that is is kind of an iterative process, right? Where these start the startups always uh, try to find like the right. Uh, features for their products to add value for their customers. Um, so they hear from their customer, they want to engage them and hear the feedback. Now, in the B2C world, this is very easy to, to do. Like there's a lot of tools, a lot of knowledge out there. So it's like VCs are, the ecosystem is very expert about how to do that. While in B2B, we found that uh, this is something that most startup founders are not uh, how to say, ready to do. So there is a lot of work for uh, the operators, for VC funds uh, to like really help the startups and educate them in, in some mm. way. So, and I think there are two ways to do this. One is since is uh, you want to engage the customer, one is to increase the opportunity to engage with corporates, with companies, and to mm. help them to really, how to say, get in touch with the companies. And the other one is like to, is to increase the quality of the feedback they get, the quality of this engagement. So if I have to give you a concrete example, I would say on the first point, um, as a VC funds, we are getting more operational and hands-on and we are connecting dots between the needs of the corporates and what startup do. And we are opening doors, we are introducing them, uh, we are creating events to match this uh, this need and create these relationships. And on the other side, so to increase the quality of uh, this search for product market fit, what we saw is that in the B2B world, usually this journey is longer, right? Because of the timing in the corporate world, mm. uh, the dynamics that there are there is not easy like launching a survey on the web. Mm. Uh, so we need to so we give guidance. I think that what helps founders is to have, first of all, guidance on uh, really like product expertise. So how to make an enterprise grade product. Uh, what are the processes in the, mm. in the B2B world? So um, I'd say um, like corporate processes, right? And, and also to, to engage them in longer collaboration, meaning making, for example, POCs that can last a few months having multiple iteration loops and feedbacks and also like helping them to understand how to navigate the corporation, right? Who are the champions? Who are the buyers? Who are the decision makers? So there is a lot more of work in trying to pull this off. Is a, and, mm. I, and I think we can play a role as investors or as accelerators and like along the whole value chain, right? Of, of, a, of the growth of a startup. Mm. So how do we get more buy-in then from corporates and enterprise? Well, that, that's that's a billion-dollar question. So I think... <laughs> no, You've got another if, 20 if, minutes, <laughs> quickly. <laughs> no, no, I, I don't think there is a one-size-fits-all really answer. Mm. Right? Like, it depends, it depends really on the, uh, on the case. What is important is to really understand what are the pain points on the, mm. of the of your customers, so really understand who are your customers and, and avoid, for example, hyper-personalization. You need always to have this trade-off mm -hmm. between having a product that it is a, available for everybody, for all the customers, mm -hmm. and solving every problem of a single customer that will be very demanding, right? It will ask you for any feature. And I just want to add that in my personal opinion, really, like the majority of the startup I saw in this space, in the B2B space, they fail not because they don't have product knowledge or technical knowledge in executing, mm -hmm. but really because they don't get to know how to integrate their solution in the overall workflow or the mm -hmm. processes of the company. So it's mostly mm -hmm. a matter of change management that they don't get. Sometimes not all the founders have previous experience in the industry mm -hmm. or 
know exactly mm. how things work in a corporate. So mm. this is at least from the B2B perspective. Mm. And the truth is you're solving for two customers or you've got a customer and a consumer. So you need to make a product that your consumer wants and solve the pain for the customer who's the, the business. Um, Amor, I saw your hand up. Yeah, I can I can just add to that, right? Like because we're we're in that space where we're really like B to B to C, which to your point, Victoria, right? Like we have clients and then ultimately we're servicing end customers. And so when we look at a startup, we also navigating the corporate environment, right? Like and I'm gonna say it's not it's not easy. Um, but I think the biggest value when when we are able to show value, um, it's it's not that hard when the value is clear. So a lot of times that communication of showing the value in terms of what does that mean for the business is sometimes the gap from a startup's perspective that we cannot translate it for a business to say, hey, this is how it can change things for your business in the ecosystem perspective versus it becomes to Virginia's point, a one-off solution that doesn't fit the overall ecosystem completely. And so that's where the value is not clear and the switching cost is very high if it's a one-off solution that doesn't fit the ecosystem completely. Mm -hmm. And so we ran into some of those issues ourselves um, where you know one solution doesn't solve everything, which is when the solution, the switching mm -hmm. cost was so high that the, the our operators of the business doesn't want to change. Uh, they're still okay to live with some of the problems that they have to live with because they don't want to change and switch to something new. Okay, so so Shifting gear from, from identifying the problem to looking at the solution, how do the product managers out there, the founders out there, the startup teams out there, how do they find their solution of that, that switching cost of actually identifying customer consumer? Uh, is the op option, uh, Virginia, like you're saying, working with, with uh, venture managers like yourself or going into incubators and accelerators like are there their skills development programs what is the best way of actually figuring this out on a practical level for our founders out there well uh and uh, of course here i'm a bit <laughs> a bit opinionated <laughs> but so i think for example what we offer like the the mm -hmm. concept of a venture studio so having mm -hmm. um, a set of experts in uh, corporate uh, environment that helps you building your product for sure helps and reduce the mortality risk of your uh, startup and this the death risk and this happens because um, we are all people so we try to combine product experience with really uh, corporate processes experience mm -hmm. and I think this is fundamental because I see founders are super talented and really like making cool AI products, they, they know all the tech out there. And the problem sometimes is much easier, is mostly about the workflow and where it fits It fits in, who's the buyer, who, the need they, they have. So I think, first of all, there is a huge opportunity for investors to be more operational and hands-on. And I find founders really appreciate this. So okay. they like not only to get money, but also to have sparing partners um, thought partners, people that can really challenge what they say and they, like, I like to challenge founders and say, so you think this is the best solution? What if you do this, mm -hmm. right? I don't think, I don't agree. Mm -hmm. I don't. So we have this, uh, like, um, exchanges that mm -hmm. I think help them see things from another perspective, right? I act as the buyer. I act as the mm -hmm. corporate client. And I think it's useful for them. This is part of the value proposition. proposition. Uh, of course, it's not the only one, but I found that it works, like from okay. what I saw recently. And that that actually leans a little bit more on the the um, angel model, where you have your investor has actual buy in on that. And and Ammo, like you said early on, it's alphabetical soup at this current stage, wh whatever series it is. But it's very much what you're mentioning is is finding. Um, your solution that has a panel or, or an expert, someone at market that, that can actually be your sparring partner. Thanos, I saw you smiling. You've got buy-in on this comment. Please jump in. <laughs> uh, yeah, so Virginia uh, had a great opinion. So I, I can understand the value that a venture uh, builder uh, can provide to the startups. I, I will talk from, uh, from the earlier stage. So from the idea stage, and I could say for someone that it's now building a product, 
uh, it's it would be great for for the team to be on the market so i mean to start trying to sell the solution even if with a, a mock even if uh, something quite uh, um, in very quite 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 early something like that it will be qu quite quite useful and to has a very very specific goal the growth uh, per week so it's important for the startups to be on the market and to learn fast either to, to uh, maybe to fail fast and learn faster so it's quite important to iterate with the customers and make the the, the loop so it's important for the startups to build uh, products that the market needs so on the access to market it's quite important for for the startups mm. So I think, um, you know, what's, what's interesting to me, what I'm hearing is that there are so many solutions out there. But the truth is, as long as our founders know you're not in it alone. Um, I know when I started, I'm giving away my age now, but when I started to have a business, I had a fax machine, an actual fax, fax machine and a secretary at the front desk because that's what denoted being a business. And the fact is I was alone. I didn't have the support, which is why I most probably went through these wild iterations and wasted a lot of bootstrapping money because I didn't have that support. So for those founders out there listening, there are a multitude of, of um, support options out there. Find what works for you as, a, as and my advice, find what works for you um, as a team, as a product, and, and, and get that support because you're not in it alone. Of course, the environment is quite important. And uh, that's the thing that uh, uh, venture builders and venture offices uh, mm -hmm. provide. And also VCs and uh, mm -hmm. angel investors could provide that environment that is quite important for, mm -hmm. uh, for that stage. And mm -hmm. uh, due to the digitalization uh, era that we now live in, and uh, it causes, as you know, COVID situation made it uh, easier, all of that. So we, we can, and there is the environment online. So you could make mm. uh, events like that, that is quite useful mm. for the people to join and to meet other people. So by tools like that, you could have access to the network. You mm. could have access to the opportunity uh, in order to build a, a startup and to understand the, re the needs and not mm. the needs for, for your city, for your, uh, and for your country, but for the whole world. And that's mm. something quite disruptive and uh, that's a thing that make uh, the undeveloped countries and the undeveloping mm. ecosystems, uh, we, we have seen that the, the, the ecosystem is booming right, right there. So we have mm. seen too many startups and unicorns that are made in, uh, in Europe. Right now, Europe has uh, around 70 uh, unicorns. There are great, uh, great, uh, they, they could act like role models for the countries. Like in Romania, there are two, three, uh, so uh, Central and Eastern Europe, we've seen the potential that these markets have. So you can understand mm. how, how the things will um, are going to, to be to what that we are waiting for more startups and more unicorns in the market. And uh, mm. the most important thing is the access, the access to, to opportunities mm. like uh, uh, Virginio and uh, Modini and Terry discussed before. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Terry, I'm going to. Oh, sorry, I'm out. Jump. Sorry, in. I'm just going to Go quickly ahead. one, you know, quick point I would Please. want to add is like, you know, the other thing we talk about now, we talk about the alphabet soup. I think for founders now, I mean, the funding stages are really a milestone approach. So I think those milestones are getting a little bit blurry now, mm -hmm. and I think that's something that we we, we want to get back to. Like, hey, for C, these are the milestones you want to accomplish for the next round. But because the rounds are so inflated, and then this is the soup the milestones now are not very clear. And that sometimes leads to this uh, indirect path, right? Like, mm -hmm. so I think that's where it's very important to have those milestones clearly defined mm -hmm. for each stage, um, which makes it clearer for the founder, the team themselves, and for anybody external who's funding them or and or working with them. Thank you. Um, I And I absolutely agree. Quick question, Emma, are you a KPI or an OKR? What well, milestones do you follow? Uh, well, it, we follow KPIs. I would say OKRs okay. are uh, more internal for us, for okay. our company. But from a startup perspective, it will be KPI metrics. KPIs. Metrics. You, yeah. I have realized that we are one or the other in, in the startup world. Um, <laughs> OK, Terry, um, over to you. A conversation which I'm pretty sure you're tired of unpacking, but I'm going to pull it through one last time. You've obviously had COVID. 
and Brexit to deal with, which is, must have had a huge impact on the startup environment. What trends, focusing on positives here, what trends are you seeing that are the fighting fit coming out of this and actually seeing success? Yeah, so I'll go into this quickly. I think that's mm. over the past 20 years, we've seen three big shocks in the UK. And strangely enough, the one that we've been least resilient to is the Great Recession in 2008, 2009. Mm. That revealed a really big requirement mm. for some of the old legacy businesses that we had to go through a more accelerated Darwinian evolution of how they are approaching customers' needs and actually addressing those addressing those requirements. So, so we've seen some really, really exciting stuff happen out, out of the UK. As and Brexit's been a a curse and a blessing in 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 ways I won't go into. But what what it's emphasised is the requirement that businesses need to become more board, borderless in terms mm. of it. You know, more traditional import export border style business for traditional startups in, for example, e-commerce, that's becoming less feasible now that we've got those additional barriers in place. But for businesses that leverage technology and can don't have to worry so much about borders, so much about trade, they you connect to the internet, you've got access to around five billion potential customers. By definition, you sell a dollar to a billion customers in your bill, or you have a billion dollar business. So we've seen really exciting emerging startups in the UK, such as Monzo, Revolut, Starling, it, disrupting retail banking. People have been around, or companies that have been around for dozens of years. Um, we've got Thread and List in the fashion industry. We've got Octopus Energy, and most recently, Bulb in the renewable energy space. So we're seeing a acceleration um, towards a lot of these more progressive businesses and a breakup of traditional um, Monopolies between various established companies and competition is always a good thing. It accelerates uh, innovation. It accelerates prog well collective progression, um, and it also makes it also makes things more optimized for the consumer from a customer experience perspective. So there are negatives to be taken from Brexit, but there are also positives that, as well as the previous disruptive forces, it's helping to mm -hmm. accelerate. Okay, thank you. And you mentioned in particular, um, you're seeing disruptions within retail and financial services. Now, I, I come from a financial services background myself, so I'm super excited to see what, what is happening within that. But what other verticals are you seeing within disruption? So, so I, think, I think this goes to a broader question. This is, this is the point that Thanos, uh, Virginia and Amadini spoke about, and that is um, if we think about what what are the re what's the reason those caused technology as an industry to expand so quickly not just vertically within it its traditional domain but to expand across other areas as well and and almost push late stage companies towards acquisitions of earlier commu or smaller communities and earlier technologies or more incumbent corporates to partner with um, innovation led design agencies and everything like that um, Technology is very much about collaboration and there's a very big focus towards open source. So over the past 20 years, there's been a real big push, both um, both publicly open source. So in terms of if you want to access some of the greatest minds in programming, there's a lot of really good resource on GitHub repositories, just kind of places around the internet. In AI machine learning as well, this has been made largely, I mean, you could argue that, for example, OpenAI's GPT-3 and other models are a bit closed box, but for the most part, a lot of these really, really advanced technologies are being made open source, if not fully available to the public to consume and build exciting things with. So I don't particularly see there being a limit to horizontal verticals. There are more challenging industries to disrupt, such as the legal industry, uh, capital markets as well. But we're seeing, so um, for capital markets, we've seen special purpose acquisition companies less driven by disruption, but more for a demand of emerging businesses to build capital and get to market quicker. Um, and for legal, a bit, a bit of a controversial opinion, there can be an argument that for some of the more kind of financial properties of some contracts, smart distributed contracts on the blockchain, even though it requires an actual legal presence, helps to almost diversify elements of that industry away from a solely legal market. So I, I don't really perceive there to be a limit to technology reaching out horizontally across industries. Okay, thank you. Um, I saw some other buy-ins and some nods and some smiles. Has everyone gone? 
gone quiet with that, just agreeing with you, Terry. All right. Um, uh, Thanos, I'm going to jump back to you looking at startup support. We've discussed multiple ways in which um, early stage and later stage can actually access support. And there is, I mean, going from the days of me and my fax machine, there are multiple avenues of support these days. Are we seeing that impact? The reality is we have huge turnover or, or fail rates of startups. Are we seeing those rates decrease and actually seeing the, this, um, the support systems come to fruition? Uh, look, the startups and the, the whole ecosystem is, uh, especially for Europe and uh, for our countries, is quite new. So incubators, accelerators, and programs has to learn the same time as startups uh, getting knowledge out of, from, from the market. So I believe that uh, we will have more startups. So the numbers are quite specific on, uh, on uh, how many startups they're going to get funding, how many startups they will make a huge success. Uh, of course, there will be a progress and we will decrease that numbers. Uh, but still, uh, you know, uh, it needs more more startups in order to make something uh, bigger and bigger and to create a more um, a very um, ecosystem, a very good ecosystem in Europe uh, in comparison if, if we'd like to compare with uh, uh, the US. And of course, there are too many barriers on uh, between the uh, the governments and the difficult the difficulties that we face due to the different laws in between the European countries in comparison with uh, the US. Uh, so right now there are some initiatives from the government's per perspective. Uh, one is uh, European uh, Startup uh, Alliance. So mm -hmm. they 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 do things in order to make the ecosystem uh, so to there is access to the whole European countries in between. Uh, so to compare it with uh, the US, but uh, for sure we've seen that there are too many programs right now, and we believe that there will be there are will be available more programs and more people as more people getting and having exits. So the their knowledge and their money that they got from that, they are going to invest back on startups. So we are we are going to see a loop, and we could see more uh, PayPal mafia guys coming from other mafias all over the world in order to build things and to build the uh, technology. Right now, the, the talent uh, and the, the technology and the digitalization that we, that we live uh, makes talent uh, universal and opportunities uh, the same. Uh, something else, else that I would like to add on the previous thing that um, we discussed is that we've seen that um, uh, the, uh, the change that um, VCs, the change that they had. So they are more uh, agnostic um, of sector, stage, and location of the startups that they invest. And that's a quite important milestone for the ecosystems mm -hmm. that we could see uh, more startups born from ecosystem all over the world. And uh, um, programs could be connected with other opportunities and make startups, uh, and not only programs, but uh, venture of builders and uh, initiatives and supporters, uh, stakeholders in general, uh, to, to build a local ecosystem and the strong local ecosystems in, in all over the world. No matter if you are in uh, South Africa or you have Omicron issues, no matter if you have a COVID Delta situation, but uh, um, you will build anything from everywhere. Mm. Thank you. And I agree with that. It's incredible to see the, the shift and the change over the years as it becomes across borders, across markets. Um, and certainly seeing that cycle coming back, like you say, of exits taking a bit of a sabbatical in between and then coming back and investing in that ecosystem again and keeping that cycle going. Okay, we have two minutes left. So I'm going to do a quick round robin um, to close off. Please can each one of you give the founders out there, the product managers out there, those that are thinking about taking their side hustle to the streets, what advice would you give them in this time of change? So we're going to work backwards. Terry, starting with you. Sure. So I think my advice would be to keep it very simple. So take solve a problem that allows you to engage with your customers super early. To that point that was mentioned earlier, it, it's, it sounds counterintuitive, can sound scary, but go out there and make your first, for example, $100 on a pro project. And the purpose of that is that you, by, by getting that kind of 
a very literal buy-in. You have very real feedback on whether what you're doing ha has a synergy with demand in the market. And if it's very difficult to kind of make that first initial stab with an idea in a way that doesn't necessarily have to scale, best to do things that don't scale first, it's very difficult to make that initial kind of stab in the market with a consumer-focused product if you're starting out bootstrapping or B2B and striking that first deal, then it can only get harder. So rather than build in a complete silo and then release when it's too late, just start engaging and start kind of getting that uh, non-scalable product out first and then begin to build a scalable solution after that. Thank you. And that's very important advice. Thank you for that. Virginia. So I'd like to build on top of what Terry said because I definitely agree with it. Uh, one thing, so two advices. One is, uh, okay, focus on the product, keep it simple. But I suggest founders always to keep an eye on the big picture, meaning like keep an eye on the macroeconomic trends, on the big waves, we call it, because sometimes your success is driven not by your execution capabilities, but really you're lucky to be in a growing market, in an exploding trend. So please try to be at the right place, the right time. This is one. And the second one that is related to this is also to keep an eye, especially in Europe, uh, to the regulation for two reasons. Why? Because this enables sometimes new businesses, new opportunities, and like startups can really like profit for this from this. And the other one is that because sometimes amazing products are built that are definitely not compliant then with some uh, incredible regulation from EU, uh, thinking about data regulation, AI Act, etc., cybersecurity, you name it. And this is a lot of money that then is spent to adapt your product and make it like to pivot to a compliant version that is really like a waste of uh, investor money. Thank you. We've got one minute left. So Thanos and then Emil. Yes, so I could say that uh, start with uh, um, find your why. So to, to, uh, to, to set up your mission and vision for your life, that's uh, the first thing that you have to do. It's quite important for, every, for everyone uh, of us. Uh, there are no good tools. There are money in the market. So it's the, the, I think the ideal um, time for someone to start a startup. And it's needed to start small, and, uh, but... Uh, the most important thing is to start. Okay. I'm and I'll, I'll just you. quickly build up on what, what was said. I think like, you know, I would just say, don't, don't get distracted. Don't get wooed by everything happening around and um, just focus on those small milestones that you can create small wins for yourself, which helps move along faster and keeps the, the pace going. Um, yeah, and that's how we Thank you. Okay, thank you, everyone. That was really interesting. And I look forward to picking each one of your brains uh, further than this conversation. Um, so please, let's keep this chat up. And um, to all of uh, the viewers or everyone dialing in, we will see you tomorrow on day two. Um, enjoy your break. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.